on behalf of the National Academies Committee to advise the U.S. Global Change Research Program, I want to extend a really warm welcome. Um, we're glad you're here and very much look forward to a really engaging meeting um, that is focused on the role of AI in scientific assessments. Um, this topic is really timely and our discussions have a real opportunity to inform ways to effectively navigate um, both the challenges and the opportunities that AI brings to efforts like the National Climate Assessment or the new National Nature Assessment. Also, before I dive in, I want to give a big thank you to those who participated in this meeting's planning process. So we had several calls throughout the past two to three months where many committee members, um, a list that you will see shortly, um, um, uh, many of the people uh, on that list um, engaged in part of this planning process and um, shared their insights to help design what um, we believe is going to be a really thoughtful, engaging, and fun meeting. So I'll share more about our meeting agenda, but first I wanna pass the mic to Stephen and Katrina for some housekeeping. Um, next one. Um, welcome, everybody. We have uh, both a full room here in uh, at the Keck Building, the National Academy's Keck Building in Washington, D.C., and a, um, a robust group online. And so I want to welcome everybody. Uh, we are running this as a fully hybrid meeting and wanting to uh, feel everybody uh, have everybody who is participating whether virtually or uh, or in person uh, feel fully a part of this meeting um, to that end um, we have a couple of housekeeping tips uh, one is um, if your name is not something we would recognize on zoom please uh, rename yourself here in the room um, I think everybody has successfully joined without uh, connecting to audio we will be using the mics and please um, if you are when you are making a comment please make sure your mic is on so that everybody can hear you um, we will also be using um, the raised hand feature within zoom um, as our primary method um, and if you can't get to the raised hand in time raise your hand and we'll Try to watch for that as well, um, but that'll be our primary way of recognizing who wants to speak. Um, and if there are any questions, please um, message uh, Caitlin Cruz or myself. Um, you've pretty much everybody who is on here has probably received emails from us over the last couple of weeks. Uh, for folks who are in the room, um, the uh, couple of orientation um, pieces, uh, the emergency exit, should we need it? The primary one is the is front door that you came through. So going out this hallway to your right um, and then through the glass doors and out the, out the front, there are also um, exits, uh, exit signs straight ahead as you come out of this building and also um, behind us uh, down the hallway following the um, exit signs um, and then finally the bathrooms are in the parallel hallway to this so go back out to the um, this open space take a right and take your first hall hallway next, next slide Um, to start, I want to acknowledge that the National Academies is physically housed on the traditional lands of the Nacotchtank or Anacostan and the Piscataway peoples past and present. We honor with gratitude the land itself and the people who have stewarded it throughout the generations and the enduring relationship that exists between these peoples and nations and this land. We thank them for their resilience in protecting this land and aspire to uphold our responsibilities to their example. We also acknowledge that our understanding of global change is closely related to and informed by indigenous knowledge and experience, and that many native communities are on the front line of impacts from these changes. Next slide. Um, expect for conduct, um, we are committed at the National Academies to fostering a professional and respectful an inclusive environment where all participants can participate fully in an atmosphere that is free of harassment and discrimination based on Id any identity based factors. Uh, we have included with the invitation and your um, 
uh, uh, joining of this meeting, a link to our um, to our harassment and bullying policy prevention thereof. Um, and um, just want to draw your attention to if you see anything in this meeting that um, you feel like is inhibiting that participation, please contact myself or the HR Service Center at National Academies. Um, those emails are in the materials that you received. Um, and with that, we look forward to all of your engagement in this meeting. Back to Julie. Great. So I'm going to provide a high level view of our agenda. As you can see, we have two days um, to really think more deeply about the use of AI for development of USGCRP scientific assessments. Um, this will be a blend of learning from experts, um, engaging each other in small groups, and having large group discussions. So we'll start today with background, um, which provides a foundation and framework for subsequent discussions. We'll step through the USGCRP's assessment process stages and think more about what happens um, in, in behind the scenes in creating the assessments. Um, then we're going to hear from um, a panel of experts on AI approaches and tools um, to really help understand this rapidly changing landscape. Um, we'll have lunch, after which we'll have a session that focuses on principles and requirements of authoritative scientific assessments. Um, this will include a panel to share an overview of considerations of principles for AI use. Um, it'll also follow um, some small group discussions and another panel that will provide insights from other organizations and agencies. Um, we'll conclude today um, with updates from the academies and the USGCRP on many programs and projects that have been moving forward as well. And then tomorrow we're going to spend time recapping what was discussed in our small groups and um, what we learned in day one, followed by uh, another series of discussions that focus on applications, opportunities, and cautions for AI use in scientific assessments, followed by time for group discussions and um, some, to the best of our ability within this meeting, a recap um, that aims to do a bit of synthesis on directions forward. Um, in all of this, um, the perspective that we're really taking is considering AI opportunities and considerations across the major stages of the USGCRP scientific assessment process, and then also considering the principles that contribute to authoritative, authoritative accurate, credible, and useful assessments. Um, so next slide. Um, Really, AI is a fast moving topic of, with rapidly evolving tools, and we're going to really aim to help inform the USGCRP's immediate need and provide a framework and components for future iterations of these considerations to um, particularly support the USGC, USGCRP's current development of AI guidelines for use in development of its assessments. And then also importantly, identify needs and requirements for the assessment community to sh share back with those developing AI methods and tools to enable appropriate use of the tools in supporting scientific assessment process. So hopefully that sets the stage. Um, we want to directly address USGCRP's request for immediate need to have a substantive discussion and hopefully um, have provided the time and space to do that. Also, as a general note in discussing these AI tools and methods, um, we'll focus on those that apply to scientific assessments rather than those that are used in the discovery process. So for example, machine learning techniques applied to climate models, very interesting topic, probably something we might take on in the future, but for this particular discussion, we're going to focus on the climate, the, the scientific assessment process. Um, I also want to highlight that, like many in our world, the advisory committee members are generally not experts in the details of AI, but all of us bring our realms of work to figure out these new tools and how they fit into our work. And we include many members of those who have worked really deeply in the National Climate Assessment, recognizing the significance of the NCA being authoritative, accessible, and useful. So we really invite everyone 
into this discussion, leveraging our own expertise and our diverse collective expertise in global change research. So hopefully that provides a bit of a preview. Um, Stephen or Deb, do you have anything else to add? Anything? I just would add on the, the second bullet here um, that the in our discussions for this meeting, um, one of the one of the recognitions of the planning group was that um, often these communities are recipients of whatever the AI tool developers are bringing to us. Um, and one of the things that we want to be able to collect and convey from this meeting is what does the what does the assessment community need from those tools and how do we start a voice from uh, the the assessment community to talk to developers of tools and techniques uh, to underscore what are needed for full and and full use of these tools within the assessment process. Yeah, great. So now I'd like to pass the mic to USGCRP to share more of their perspective on the topic. Um, Mike, do you want to start us out? Hi, good morning. Um, my first, my sincere apologies for not being there in person. Um, I, I'd really rather be there in person. Um, I, I want to say thanks to the group, how much we appreciate this. We're really, really interested in what you have to say. It's important what we're doing and where we're going now. But with for all the specifics, I want to turn the, the floor over to Ariella and let her walk through where we are with this and what we need from you and why. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Ariella Zykerman. This is not work. Yes. Zykerman, I am the director of the Sixth National Climate Assessment. It's really nice to meet you all in person. I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Um, I think this is our first time together <laughs> besides online and where I can see all your faces at once. So, um, and I'm sorry to those behind me who can only see my, oh, you can see my face. Cool. Um, <laughs> I thought you can only see my back. That's, that's great. Um, uh, so thank you to Stephen and to the planning committee for taking us seriously on this topic and really allowing us the space to think through these issues. Um, it's no small issue, even though it might just be one AI policy, it actually has huge ramifications for the assessment. So thank you for taking the time to, to help us work through this, um, this really interesting and, and weighty topic. Um, and thank you to all the panelists, if you're online already, for the time that you're taking to talk to us. We appreciate it and look forward to hearing from you. Um, so as all of you know, assessments are a very special type of report. Those that are published by USGCRP are called highly influential scientific assessments. And highly influential to me is a very weighty term. It means that a lot is at stake when we publish something. It has to be compliant with a number of laws, policy, programmatic funding, and other behavioral decisions are based on it, and communities are impacted by it. The implication is that what is produced through the scientific assessment processes at the USGCRP impacts decisions at all levels, from Congress to the local. People look to the assessment like the National Climate Assessment, but not limited to it, so including the National Nature Assessment and the other special reports we put out, as authoritative forms of information. But why do they do that? And this is really key when we think through AI. Why is it highly influential? It's for a number of reasons. The process is inclusive. It's developed by groups of experts in their field, hundreds of authors, technical contributors, data gurus, who come together through consensus to identify the most pressing issues and evaluate all the available information to distill it into what the public needs to know. The process is engaged as diverse stakeholders, including the external peer review by the academies, give feedback, including what's important to include, what types of information would strengthen the content, and why this is important to know. Then this feedback gets filtered through the assessment process back again to identify what we actually know with certainty about those things. The process is transparent and traceable. Authors document their decision processes from start to finish, including their assessments of likelihood and confidence through traceable accounts. All knowledge and information sources, including non-peer reviewed data sources, are vetted and tracked through information quality and citation management protocols. All data is open sourced, including the codes for model development to ensure the information is reproducible and traceable. We find this in the metadata standards. So as we find ourselves embedded in a quickly evolving world of AI, we're asking ourselves what is or should be the role of AI in assessments like the National Climate Assessment and the National Nature Assessment. 
And how can AI be both a help and a hinder to the assessment product and process? To do this, we're thinking through a number of key questions for determining a course of action. How can AI uphold the principles that make the assessment authoritative and trustworthy? Can AI be held to the same standards as the rest of the assessment in terms of transparency, inclusivity, and traceability? Where might AI put the assessment at risk from being undermined, second-guessed, or being non-compliant with policies and laws? Where might AI be appropriate or inappropriate for the assessment, and how can we give the authors guidance on this? And so within these big overarching questions, there are also nitty-gritty questions, which we ask of all inputs and tools that the assessment uses. Are the tools we use peer-reviewed, evaluated, and reproducible? Can we, pre can we reproduce the results of that work? Is the method or the algorithm publicly available and defensible? Do we, know that the data are do we know what the data are behind this piece of literature or a model that's produced? And what are the identifiable biases embedded in those data? So NCA6 and NNA are already well underway, and the USGCRP has developed an AI policy as part of our guidance to authors. The policy really does two things. The first, it prohibits the use of AI for the generation of assessment text passages, text passages meaning all text in the assessment must be the author's own work or referenced from the original source. We believe that this ensures the traceability and transparency of the content of assessments. It also ensures that the text is written by a consensus of a team of known experts and not an external source, where training, bias, and other processes are not traceable. But it does not preclude the use of editing or grammar tools for revisions to improve writing clarity, or the use of AI for assistive technologies for activities like brainstorming, initial graphic development, or the identification of literature like literature reviews. We acknowledge that AI is a rapidly evolving field and is widely discussed, particularly as groundbreaking technology that has endless potential and possible significant benefits. We also want to emphasize that USGCRP assessments are required to deliver authoritative and trustworthy, highly influential documents. So we feel that this is not the place for us to be early adopters or experimental users of new technologies. As such, our guidance both reflects the current state of science of AI in assessments, which is an emerging field, and protects the, protects the assessment by holding AI to the same scientific rigor and standards we would hold any other input to the assessment. The absolute worst case scenario for us would be that the information in the assessment comes into question because of an AI generated output that turns out to be incorrect, not reproducible or untraceable. We also know that there are likely to be new and exciting developments over the course of the ongoing assessments. And we're eager to understand what the opportunities might be to enhance the assessments. And we recognize that our guidance will also need to evolve over time, perhaps beyond author guidance to other applications. So over the next two days, we're interested and eager to learn more from the committee and the guests about what are the potential uses of AI that would enhance the assessments? What are the potential pitfalls of AI to the well-being of the assessments? What are places where we might evolve the guidance going forward, particularly questions about AI use we might not have anticipated? And what are some ways in which we can improve the guardrails or the best practices for authors that support their potential uses of AI while also ensuring content is not only compliant with existing policies and law, but also ensures public trust? We're really looking forward to hearing from you today and a very robust conversation over the next two days. Thanks. A wonderful, great, thank you for that. Um, Stephen, do we have some time for a few questions? Just one or two, and then we'll uh, get going. But if there are some baseline questions around that, that statement um, as a starting point for our meeting. Thank you, Ariella. Right. That was really helpful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you so much. Um, and. Now I believe I'm passing it to Deb for our first session. Thank you. I, I said we're fast and everybody's like, no, we're three minutes behind. That should have been <laughs> obvious. <laughs> um, so in this session, we're going to welcome a range of speakers um, to help us provide a foundation and framing for the discussion over the next 
few days. And I, th I, th I want to draw your attention to some of the principles and some of the the, the criteria that the guidelines um, that that uh, Ariella went through as part of her opening introduction and and ask you to revisit what she is using as uh, the critical pieces of how to insert AI into the pro uh, assessment process as you think through these speakers. Our first speaker is going to be uh, David Reed Miller. He's a member of our committee. And he's going to provide an overview of the US GCRP scientific assessment process. And he'll talk about, he's going to break the process apart and talk about the key roles and pieces of the assessment process. And so if you can use the, the guidelines and the, the criteria for robustness that Ariella went through, that would be really great because it will help us address each piece of the scientific assessment. So uh, then we'll have four additional speakers and I'll introduce each one of them in turn. And so let me start with, um, with Dave uh, Reed Miller. You heard a little bit about what he does at the beginning, so I'll just briefly go through this. He's the director of the Climate Center of, at the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, where he leads a team focused on delivering climate service to coastal and marine stakeholders. Prior to his current position, he served in a number of climate science policy positions in the federal government, including director of the Fourth National Climate Assessment. He has also served as a fellow with the US Senate and the National Academies, and he received his PhD in atmospheric sciences from the University of Washington and a BA from Colgate University. So Dave, I believe you're already on. I sure am. Thanks, Deb. I'll go ahead and share my screen here and get going. Um, good. Can I get a thumbs up or does everything look okay? All right. Thanks, Mike. <laughs> All right. Um, so first, I just want to say um, welcome to everybody in the room uh, and in particular to the USGCRP staff, especially um, Ariella, uh, I'm thrilled that you're in this position uh, and just know that um, there's a, a select few of us who know what it's like to sit in that seat um, and each iteration you would you might think it gets a little bit easier because we've we've done it before um, but it seems like new issues and topics and demands emerge every round um, and so this this conversation is a fantastic example of, of exactly the type of challenges um, that you're grappling with. Um, and I'm, I'm, I was really encouraged by your opening remarks. Um, you know, as a as a creature of the bureaucracy, I uh, love risk aversion. So I just <laughs> know that you'll have a sympathetic voice in that. Um, so I, I broke this down. I just have a couple of slides, but I, I wanted to talk about both the roles of the assessment, but also um, the the kind of components of the process. And so when it comes to the roles, most of this is going to be um, old news to, to the folks in the room. Um, there's a whole host of uh, kind of key contributors that I wanted to highlight here. These are the people that are actually um, really creating the content, um, not necessarily reviewing it. Uh, but really creating the content. Um, and one thing I really don't want us to miss is the role of the technical support unit in this process. Um, there is a kind of natural inclination to focus on the, the authors as they're going to be creating the, the um, in a sense, the ideas for the graphics, but also the, the narrative. But there as, as you'll see, I point out a whole host of opportunities for AI to be considered in the work of the technical support unit as well. Um, this uh, graphic is from uh, one of the appendices in, in NCA4, um, and it was included in the, the briefing materials. Um, I won't go through every step here. Suffice to say, the intention of this graphic was in part to <laughs> Uh, relay to the audience just kind of how complicated the process is and, and how many steps are involved. Uh, the color coding just denotes really who has the NCA at that stage. So the orange ones are where it's in the hands of the federal government. The black ones are where it's in the hands of the author teams. And then the blue ones are where it's um, in the hands of the public, so to speak, um, including the National Academies. 
And so as you can see throughout the process, it really does change hands quite a number of times. Um, and there's there's opportunities throughout uh, for consideration of uh, uh, AI in the, the three plus years that it'll take to, to pull this together. The other thing I think is really important is to, to think about the, the components of the NCA. You know, historically, you think about um, any of these uh, highly influential scientific assessments, whether we're talking domestically around the NCA or potentially even NNA, uh, but also internationally, the IPCC, IPBES assessments, and so on, as sort of the report content, right? The actual overview, the chapters, and so on. Um, but increasingly, there are a whole host of associated products that derive from the assessment itself. Um, when we're talking about the NCA, this includes the official report of record, so to speak, which is the PDF of the report. Um, but that has um, been translated into multiple languages in the past couple of iterations. More of it has been translated, so that's worth keeping in mind. Um, the website itself, which has uh, improved functionality each inter iteration, uh, including with, if you're a, an author, you know this level of detail uh, perhaps painfully well, the collection of metadata, um, the chapter handouts, which are basically executive summaries, the um, uh, PowerPoints that uh, USGCRP staff create to basically make it easier for um, anybody to present the content of, of uh, the NCA. Um, and this time around, kind of three big new components, the Interactive Atlas, the Art by Climate Gallery, and even the podcast. Um, and so I highlight those as kind of new <laughs> uh, products um, that ultimately is going to mean for Ariella and the team, <laughs> do you continue to do that and add more? Or um, uh, uh, what are the other opportunities? And, and frankly, what's being used most? What's um, what's not um it hasn't been created yet, but would be useful. Um, and I'm sure those conversations are, are ongoing among the Federal Steering Committee as well. So the, I think this is my last slide here, um, but this is kind of the way I was thinking about it um, as someone who has lived the, the details of this, is thinking about where AI, you know, can really create, increase the efficiency of the process. And um, for anybody that's engaged in uh, either uh, the IPCC or the um, um, NCA processes, you'll know that there are a number of steps that are, are pretty tedious and or cumbersome. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of them uh, kind of chronologically throughout that three plus years that I talked about. And the first is really that scene setting and literature phase, literature review phase. And the scene setting, what I mean by that are... Um, you know, there's a lot of uh, public engagement that occurs in the upstream side of this um, that includes really scoping the assessment as a whole. What are the chapter topics? You know, what have we covered before? What are some emergent topics? Um, who are the national experts that we should be integrating into the process? Who are some of the um, emergent leaders that may not be, you know, in any of our current Rolodexes or networks that we really want to provide some visibility towards? Um, and so really kind of... Um, thinking about the opportunities for AI and identifying, frankly, uh, some of those um, topics and individuals. The second is probably what we're thinking about most, although there are issues in here that um, uh, may not be readily apparent. And this is not just the writing and the figure generation, but the review stages and, and interagency clearance processes, which obviously is an iterative process over the course of um, about a year and a half or two. Um, one of the, there are a number of, of challenges with a report um, of the length and depth of the NCA, and, and one of them is cross-chapter consistency. It's always sort of the anxiety-inducing thing of like, does, did, did the transportation chapter say something that the Northeast chapter said as well, but slightly differently, and how do we make sure that those are consistent so someone doesn't come back and say, ha-ha, I found an inconsistency. You guys don't know what you're doing. Um, so is there a role, you know, um, for sort of um, uh, uh, kind of language uh, um, identification? Uh, another big thing, which is currently done sort of manually, if you will, is um, uh, report-wide themes. Um, and I would be remiss if I didn't highlight Alexa Jay in, in the National Coordination Office in particular, who did a phenomenal job of, of helping to 
um, sort of uh, elevate some of those themes in, in, in writing the overview, um, not just for NCA4, but I presume for, for NCA5 as well. Um, metadata collection, as I said, is a very tedious, but also incredibly important piece of uh, the NCA in terms of its uh, transparency um, and reproducibility. So um, are there opportunities in that aspect? I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, figure permissions. Um, and the other thing I would just highlight is citation checking. Uh, another NCO staffer that deserves a lot of recognition here is Fred Lipschultz. Fred, at least in NCA4, did the remarkably tedious job of literally clicking through almost every citation to make sure where it was invoked. The, the, um, the content of that paper actually did address and individually say what the authors asserted it said. Um, so just, you know, these are kind of behind the scenes things that happen to, to hopefully give you even more sort of um, appreciation for the rigor and robustness of these uh, products. One piece that probably doesn't get as much um, appreciation um, is the report and website production. And this is really um, some of the work of the technical support unit. And it's a, it's a huge process. So, you know, almost from the start, you know, there's a, a web production team at the technical support unit that is thinking about how to, to lay this all out uh, on um, a, a web presentation. And so there's, um, there are, new requirements from accessibility standards in terms of whether it's alt text creation for figures or uh, 508 compliance or other types of um, uh, accommodations that um, uh, could offer opportunities for, for AI. One thing that I know has been uh, kind of the holy grail in some sense for the NCA has been really smart search capabilities. So if you want to, you know, look at... Um, uh, climate impacts in Washington state and um, somebody has written something about Spokane that it would recognize that Spokane is in Washington, uh, for example, um, and also kind of the, the non-English translations. And then finally, the, the release dissemination and follow-on activities. Um, you know, again, we've, we have, uh, we, the NCO USGCRP has, um, uh, you know, used outside sources to, to track media coverage, um, but we've really struggled, the NCO and, and USGCRP as a whole has struggled to understand user info and use cases. So who is using this, who is not using this, how are they using it and how are they not using it and how can it be a more useful product? Um, so I think there's uh, opportunity in that. Uh, research gaps is another big uh, opportunity to be harvested out of the National Climate Assessment. Um, we sort of did this manually uh, with NCA4, but everything is there to really kind of craft a bit of a research agenda or at least a research gap identification for the federal government and frankly, the broader uh, climate community, um, particularly through the traceable accounts where we you're literally charged with identifying what we don't know about certain uh, aspects of what was covered. The other thing that could be a real opportunity, and this might be good test case, is thinking about topical derivative products. Um, you know, the, in, in NCA4, I know we, we created or started to create at least a, a derivative product around fisheries related content um, in, in the NCA, which obviously was in the ocean and marine resources chapter, uh, but was taken up in, in a number of other chapters as well. And so are there opportunities for, for AI to kind of address um, uh, or kind of synthesize some of that content in, in, in the words of kind of Ariella, sort of that low risk environment um, that can sort of be externally vetted then. So with that, that's everything I have. I'm, I'm happy to leave this up or, or take it down and, and kind of pivot to the, to the next conversation. I don't know if there's time or space for questions or comments, but I'll turn it over to you, Deb. Yeah, I think we have time for one or two questions. Does does anyone have a question for Dave? Um, Ariella, you you kind of talked about some of the guidelines that are already in place, and so I want I wanted to know how much that is. Uh, how this seems like a longer list than what you had talked about. Maybe you could bridge that gap. Um, a lot of these are processes within those 
bigger topics. Inclusivity, engagement, traceability, and transparency are more like principles. These are actions that it takes to, to get to those things, like chapter topics, that is captured in the traceable accounts, but how that happens sort of through the authors and through the chapter leads is its own thing. But they're consistent with each other. Yes. seems like, okay. Other questions? So if you do have a question, if you'll start with your name, um, introduce yourself. Yeah, it's okay. Hi, David, it's Bill Collins. Um, thank you for this description of what you're up to. I um, I guess I had two comments. The first is that the uh, one of the challenges that you face is just dealing with the torrent of literature, and one of the one of the um, uh, reports that we looked at in on in preparation for this meeting pointed out that the IPCC's uh, percentage coverage of the center of your literature has been dropping steadily, so it's now down to about twenty percent, if not less than that compared to about 60 to 70% for the first assessment. I'm assuming that's also true for the National Climate Assessment, that you're facing the same kind of challenge. Um, so the the question here is may not be what's tedious. It's how do you be sufficiently inclusive of all the scientific input that you might want to draw from? The other question I had for you has to do with indigenous knowledge, because I'm, almost, I'm virtually certain that is not being used to train AI. It's a, you know, it's an obligation of the National Climate Assessment to be inclusive of those sources of knowledge as well. Um, but it seems orthogonal to what's going into AI. So um, those are my two questions for you. So Dave, why don't you start by repeating both questions just quickly? Sure, yeah, I think the, the first question was, as I understood it, Bill, um, and let me just say, welcome to the committee. Thrilled that you're here with you with your uh, expertise and experience is really a, a win for for everybody. Um, how to deal with the explosion in literature, uh, and and I think that the issue is was really that the, um, you know, the numerator may be changing a little bit, but the denominator is changing much more quickly. And and how do we make sure that we are kind of really being representative in our assessment? And I think that's a really good question. I'll, I'll touch on it in a second before turning over to Ariella. The second one, which I really don't have a good answer for, is is around um, indigenous knowledge and and whether or how uh, indigenous knowledge would be um, used to to train AI or or or, or integrated into um, you know this aspect of the assessment process, where we do have policies around sort of the integration of indigenous knowledge. I mean, there's specific training that um, author teams go through to to kind of understand that. On the first point, you know, I think it, it was interesting because I remember in some of the um, scoping conversations we had for this meeting, um, there was concern about using AI, um, you know, in the literature review phase because it would, you know, potentially introduce bias and in, um, in terms of what is surveyed. Um, I would argue that authors inherently are introducing bias in what they survey. They're gonna they're they're gonna survey the the. Um, the journals that they respect most, they're going to survey the literature that they're most familiar with, and whether they want to admit it or not, they're likely to cite articles that they have contributed to themselves. And so, um, so I do think there's an opportunity for AI to kind of um, be an initial sort of step in improving that. Um, but I do think, you know, there's a lot of Let's be honest, like there's a lot of kind of garbage journals being created out there just to provide a forum for people to publish. And I think there's... Um, um, there's still a role for sort of the human eye in in sort of uh, uh, curating what an initial lit review from from AI might be able to provide. That's my two cents. Ariella, do you want to add anything? Um, yeah, I appreciate the the problem. <laughs> uh, it's it is significant, but um, I was one of those people who brought up the bias in an AI search, and I think it's it's worth mentioning that you're right, Dave. That authors have biases when they bring it to the table. So do AI searches. <laughs> and so um, and so do people who, all of us who are involved in peer review also bring biases when we have journals that publish certain kinds of articles. And so there's many, many biases. I think the issue is to acknowledge them and think about the guidelines we can give 
across all of these different things to make sure that we're really bringing the most powerful science to the table. And it's not saying yes or no to any of them, but really thinking through each of them as individual inputs, how we can be the most robust and really keep the standard up for what kind of literature goes in. And so I think those are things we have to think about. Um, Dave, you didn't tackle indigenous knowledge, but can I just take a second? Okay, so so we're we're about short on oh, on okay. time. So let me um, let me get Mike real quickly, and and then Jane will come back to you. Dave has indicated he's going to stay for the Q and A at the end. So um, Mike, did you have something? I don't know if it's if. If this is worth interrupting everybody or not, Dave, I love that, and and so the meeting's already been helpful. I, what your what we're concerned is that we want to make sure that the content of the reports comes out of the brains of our, of our authors and the reviewers and and human beings. Um, the the place where we said there's alternative um, ways to use it that could be acceptable to us, like the citation checking. Like looks like a fab fabulous way to apply AI to say, hey, we don't think this citation actually said what the author quoted. It's like, great, we'll go check that. Um, I, and just like we, we talked about doing a literature search, making sure you get a comprehensive literature is a big, hairy literature um, search, searching literature, not, not reviewing the literature. So I think there are places for AI and, and we've talked about them, and, but you've already helped us with that graphic looking for other uh, examples we could use in, in where we could could apply it, I think. Thanks. Okay, so we're going to move to our to our first session now, and we have uh, four speakers, and we'll have a Q and A at the end of each of the at the end of all four. And I believe Dave is also agreed to stay on for that Q and A at the end of all four. And I'll give a brief introduction to each speaker as they come up. Um, these speakers are going to help. So help us to sort of frame the state of AI, frame the, the range of tools and methods and possibilities that AI might offer in, assess, in the assessment process. So our first speaker is, um, is Dr. Heng Yu. Are you on, is he on? She, sorry, is she on? Yes, I'm here. So, so Dr. Heng Yu is a professor uh, in the Warrington College of Business at University of Florida. And she also directs the Center for AI Ethics, Cyber Governance, and Privacy Management. She currently serves as the Editor-in-Chief for ACM Transactions on Management Information uh, Systems. And her research is at the intersection of data privacy, data ethics, and fairness in machine learning. Thank you so much on behalf of the whole committee. Thank you so much for, for joining us this morning. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. And I'm really glad to be here. And I'm going to share my um, slides and just making sure everyone's seeing my slides. Yep. I assume this is a... okay. Yeah, good morning, everyone. And I'm going to just simply talk about uh, all the uh, general background of the, um, of, uh, yeah, thank, thanks for the text messages uh, saying that you see the slides. Um, so I'm going to just generally talking about the AI landscape and general capabilities. Uh, I'm not doing research on scientific assessment, but I can generally talking about, you know, what are the new capabilities afforded by this generation of AI. And more importantly, I want to talk about, you know, or contrasting these two different generations of AI, symbolic AI and machine learning empowered AI. What are the fundamental, you know, characteristics that differentiate these two generations of techno technologies? And more importantly, if when, when we contrast the fundamental characteristics of this two wave of technology, you will see what are the new opportunities emerged by this generation of AI and what are the unique challenges we are facing towards this generation of AI. Um, and from this slides, uh, you will see that, you know, AI is not new. Uh, it was initiated in the 50s. And in this visualization, you can trace the evolution of AI over the past 70 years. And I don't have time going to the each breakthrough in the past 70 years of AI history. Rather, I want you to, to, to really pay attention to these two different colors I use uh, on this history uh, you know, of AI development. One is the um, green color represents 
a period of AI uh, advancement, which is dedicated for AI summer. And then the red indicating AI winter, where the progress actually slows down. So the very first AI summer starting from the 50s with a strong belief that the any physical simple systems has a necessary and sufficient means for general AI intelligent action. And the very first generation of AI is called symbolic AI, which was a dominating paradigm of AI research from the middle 50s until the middle 90s. It is based on high level symbolic representations of problems, logic, and search. And in the 60s, challenging questions were raised by the design philosophy of the very first uh, generation of AI, which is symbolic AI. AI developers, you know, try to try their best to address the complexity of our daily life through the lens of pure logic. And then engineers crafted every single rule for every single decision their AI systems was required to make. However, the inherent fuzziness and nuance of the real world complexity proved too complicated to be represented by this approach. And in the 80s, uh, you know, emerged from the AI research community within computer science, uh, the researchers started realizing that AI systems constructed with these handcrafted rules were incapable of learning new rules on its own. When faced with unusual situation, age cases, these systems often failed. So by the early 90s, the whole community realized that the AI system, the very first generation of AI systems built by handcrafted rules lead to a lot of artificial systems, but they haven't reached to the intelligence they try to get. So after reaching this conversation, uh, the community slows down the AI research, uh, that leading to a long AI winter until the 2010. What happened in 2010, big data becomes reality and which empower deep learning took off. Deep learning is uh, a statistic based machine learning technology where rules are no longer important. And uh, for this generation of AI, the new generation of AI empowered by deep learning, the key idea is to learn, let a computer learn by example instead of programming it with those handcrafted rules. So we feed these uh, you know, new technologies, the machine learning algorithms with giant amount of data and let them become universal approximators to approximating these giant amount of data and derive the relationships on its own. And here on this slide, I actually show you one beautiful story about this generation of AI, how they encourage or how they kind of enable new discoveries. For example, scientists train their machine learning models uh, to look for new planets from the data that generated by 660 stars and discovered two new planets missed in previous search. So this is one beautiful example illustrating how today's deep learning can empower or lead to new scientific discovery. And I think, you know, this goes without saying that this generation of AI give us advanced capability of doing giant amount of data integration, pattern recognition from this messy uh, giant amount of the data. And they have automated replication capabilities, which may facilitating reproducibility in science. And also because of their, you know, deep learning empowered AI technique, their strength is also aligned, better handling uncertainties. And I think all these empower or empower the next generation of scientific assessment research. But I also want to quickly mention that uh, nothing is free, nothing is perfect. And this generation of AI also give us many, many challenges we have to face. And the technology itself brought us a lot of other uncertainties and challenges we have to ask ourselves in the process of using these technologies for scientific assessment or for any kind of purposes. And I just want to quickly zoom in again to this new uh, two generation of AI, first generation symbolic AI, the current generation of AI revolution is empowered by statistical machine learning. And we also have other names for these two generation of AI, the very first generation AI, we often call rule-based AI. And now we also name um, the current generation deep learning empowered AI, sometimes as black box AI. Let me 
give you a quick kind of definition why we call it as a black box. So here I'm trying to visualize my philosophy or my understanding of symbolic AI. And if we examine, right, if we're carefully looking into the objectives of the rule-based AI, which is the first generation of AI, the focus was on approximating the ground truth by constructing rules and then developing AI models to you know, implement these handcrafted rules. This is our design philosophy. We are later on after you know, 40 years of research and the computer science community realized that this these systems built on handcrafted rules didn't lead to any real intelligence. So the second generation, they tried some, something, you know, completely different, right? They, uh, they now ask, since, you know, rules doesn't lead us to the real intelligence, how about building AI models that just simply approximate giant amount of data we collected because big data now is a reality. And if the data are large enough, that should represent the observations of the ground truth or the complexity of our daily life. So the natural question is, if we build models based on or for the philosophy to become becoming a universal approximator, just approximating the giant of amount of data, do such kind of model is actually uh, capturing our ground truth. And this is, uh, you see that I put a question mark between ground truth and our today's AI model. And before entertaining that question here, I'm going, you, I'm going to give you uh, a quick example. This is a famous beach cow example. From this example illustrate that today's AI, which means the new generation of AI may not always capture the ground truth. In this case, uh, the, the, the machine learning or uh, the deep learning uh, algorithm successfully identified the cow in the first image, but failed to recognize the cow from the other two images when the researchers Sequently switched the background from grass to beach, and they failed to recognize the cows. So from this beach cow example, we actually can tell that, you know, we come to assume our AI models always know the ground truth. And for from the beach cow example, the ground truth, which is across three images, they're all capturing cow, but to the deep learning algorithm, sometimes they only recognize the cow sitting on the grass is a cow, but then cow with the background of beach, they fail to recognize that. And this is what I want to <laughs> highlight here. For the AI research community, they are still focusing on their focus is on data. Their focus is on about how to build their models to become universal approximator to approximate giant amount of the data. That's their focus. But for users of AI systems, like business organizations, or like scientific community, when we try to develop new AI tools to do important tasks, such as scientific assessment, we have to attend to the meanings of these AI models. Because if we don't attend to those um, meanings of these AI models, there are a lot of challenging questions that facing, at least in my research group, we're trying to you know, entertain these four different kinds of stream of research, answering how is my data used by AI? Why does Amazon's AI hiring tool show bias against women? And how to ensure the outputs of AI models are trustworthy and useful? You know, because there are black box nature, right? How we can trust the output of these AI models. And more importantly, I want to quickly give you just one tiny example to illustrate how important it is to bring domain expertise to build AI tools together, catering, catering to each specific use of AI. So that problems I highlighted on my fourth bullet point on these slides, it's a specification problem. That is a problem, a tiny problem in the broader landscape of human AI teaming we're doing, but then it's un just simply answer one question. How do we state what we want from the AI systems? And I won't go to the you know, details. I'm just going to give you this entertaining example for you to think about it. Okay, this happens in a conversation between me and my 10 year 10 year old son who is a Pokemon fan. And there was one day and I kind of introduced him with a super powerful ChatGPT. And I, I told him that ChatGPT can't do anything. He, he, he wants to challenge the AI, right? Challenge the ChatGPT 4. And he typing this uh, 
prompt, say, draw a rolling moon in space surrounded by rocks. And then this is the output of this, uh, of the chat GPT-4. And I was, oh, this is so cool, right? It's such a rolling moon in the space surrounded by, by rocks. And his response was, this is so disappointing. This is stupid. Why the AI didn't know that Roe Moon is actually a dragon? And I would say, what? What, what, what do you mean? And he said, no, the Roe Moon is a figure in Pokemon, <laughs> it's a dragon. And then I said, you know, yeah, the AI may not really read your mind, right? And you have to say it. So he tried it again, and this time ChatGPT4 get it, and then generated a dragon figure uh, to him, which satisfy the Pokemon fan. So I'm simply using this kind of example to illustrate that, you know, in the scientific collaboration or especially in the interdisciplinary collaboration, I often have this kind of feeling. It's just exactly like what Rowing Moon means to a Pokemon fan versus non-Pokemon uh, non fan. And also, you know, when we, when I observe how computer scientists work with psychologists, when they use the term model and their mental model of model in their scientific discipline are completely different to each other. We as researchers may kind of have different models, different common senses in each scientific discipline. And now we're, talk, we're talking about using AI to consolidate across different fields and to aggregate the you know, comprehensive understanding of the literature and the scientific discovery, we have to be very careful and mindful. And I have to remind you that today's AI systems lacks the common sense as humans do or as researchers do. And so the point I want to make here is that it's very important for domain experts to collaboratively work with AI system developers and to better create human AI teams and to better create human AI collaborative feature. And with that, I would just uh, conclude with showing our beautiful report produced by National Academies, Human AI Teaming, and that highlighted a lot of important challenges in this space as well. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Okay, please stay around. We'll have the Q&A after the remaining three speakers. Our next speaker is uh, Daniel Weld. He's a professor emeriti at Paul G. Allen School of Computer Science and Engineering. Um, and the general manager and chief scientist of semantic scholar at the Allen Institute of Artificial Intelligence. He received his bachelor degrees in both computer science and biochemistry at Yale and an MIT from a PhD from MIT's artificial um, intelligence lab. Uh, he, uh, he's the founding editor for the Journal of AI and was an editor for the journal area editor for the Journal of ACM. So I, I think you're on, Dan. Yes? Um, yeah, hopefully people can hear me. Yes. Um, good, and you're seeing the, the slides, I hope. Um, yep. Very good. Um, what I wanna do today is tell you about some of the work we've been doing at the Allen Institute for AI on the semantic scholar system. So this is a free um, service. We've been working on it for about nine years. Think about it as a PubMed like uh, or Google Scholar system that's powered by AI that reads literature um, for you and uh, attempts to make uh, your process a little bit more efficient. Um, uh, we do a lot of research as well as maintain um, this product, which um, has 8 million monthly active users, has an index of about 221 million papers, um, and uses AI all through all through the process. Um, I call it a product, but it's a free free service um, that we make available. Um, the way we think about um, uh, sort of the scholarly process is, um, or like one of the ways we think about it is in terms of a funnel where one tries to find a set of papers, one tries to triage and figure out which ones require more attention, um, read a much smaller set of those, and then try to synthesize results, come up with new ideas for research. I'm going to talk very briefly about each of these stages. Um, the first stage is discovery. Um, we've been doing lots of work on this. I'm going to pick one tiny piece to tell you about. Um, 
And um, in one sense, it's kind of a vanilla system. Um, it recommends papers to you. So you give it a set of papers that you um, either think are appropriate or inappropriate. Our system learns um, a machine learning model that recommends which papers it thinks you like. And then it sends you um, a daily or a weekly email update um, with the papers uh, that it thinks are important for you. Um, a number of different services have something like this. The thing I like the most about Semantic Scholar is it's um, very controllable. So um, this is a picture of my library page. Um, I sort my papers into a number of different folders. One of the folders is called agency and tool use. Um, and I've turned on alerts for that. So uh, very simply by organizing my papers in a natural way in the library, and I can decide which ones I wanna keep around and which ones I actually wanna get active recommendations on. Um, moving along, I wanna talk about, uh, supposing you've got a set of papers that you're interested in perusing, you think might be relevant to your task, how do you um, decide whether they um, deserve more time and attention? Again, there's too many things here for me to talk about all of them. So I'm gonna just quickly give you a sample on, uh, on two projects. Um, one um, we call uh, TLDRs, too long, didn't read. Um, they're inspired by people's um, uh, Twitter messages recommending papers. So I've just done a search on Semana Scholar for open information extraction. Um, the system found uh, 500,000 results. Uh, the top result was um, this paper here, and notice um, that our system has gen used generative AI to create a one sentence summary of the paper. Um, this is old news now with ChatGPT and so on, but something that we put into the product about five years ago, and uh, we can run efficiently enough that it uh, we can run it on millions and millions of papers. Um, many people say, why do you want a, a TLDR? Isn't an abstract? Um, um, uh, enough. In fact, they're very, very different. Um, the information that we find in TLDRs, and again, we did uh, studies on human gener generated TLDRs to inspire the algorithm, show that um, a TLDR usually takes information from many different places in the paper, and then it really encapsulates it uh, down. It's not at all like, uh, like an abstract. Um, once we uh, we put this into product into an A-B test, we we're trying to figure out whether it was something that we should actually keep in the product. And we had a hard time trying to figure out um, how we should even assess this. Um, we did notice the user feedback was very positive, so that was good, but we wanted something more quantitative. And the question was, what should we measure? Should we measure how long people were spending on the Semantic Scholar pages? That's something that internet companies often do. The question was, do we really want people to spend more time on our page or less time on the page? Um, similarly, the click-through rate, um, we couldn't figure out whether we wanted the click-through rate to go up or we wanted the click-through rate to go down. Um, to make a long story short, actually, it was kind of complicated uh, due to our, our metrics. Um, uh, but when we rolled this out and used the TLDRs on these email alerts, we had a new opportunity to do a test. Um, so in particular, we sent half of our users uh, the truncated abstracts that we'd been previously using and half of the users, we gave them the TLDR in their, uh, in their email alerts. And we were hoping to see an increase in clicks and saves. Um, and we were also hoping that people wouldn't unsubscribe to these email alerts. Um, so the good news was um, we saw no increase in the unsubscribe rate, so that's nice. Um, but then the confusing thing is actually we saw a statistically significant decrease in the click-through rate. And that again gave us this question, you know, why are people clicking through less? One answer might be that they find this less engaging and um, and so the other is as actually maybe the opposite, that it was creating greater efficiency. It was helping them find papers and they weren't clicking through to bad papers nearly as much. So we did a conditional analysis where we looked at two paths, people where they click through on the email and then they save the paper to their library versus they click through um, on the email and then they decided not to save it into their library. And what we saw is in the first path, um, the rates didn't change at all. But in the second path, um, we saw that um, they, people were much less likely, or rather, people were much more likely to save it through to their library when they clicked through on a TLDR. So they were 
finding a much higher percentage of um, save worthy papers with the TLDRs. And this led us uh, the confidence that this is really saving people time um, in terms of helping them find the papers they care about. Okay. Um, the next thing I wanna talk about is AI powered question answering. Lots of tools out there, Perplexity and others. And of course, Semantic Scholar has question answering too. I'd like to distinguish between two kinds of question answering. Question answering where you're asking about a specific paper and question answering where um, you're asking over a whole corpus of papers. Um, I think these are both useful and interesting. The first one is much easier than the second. So my high level message is, um, well, we've decided to put uh, paper specific question answering in the product, whereas corpus question answering is still something we're working on. We don't think it's quite ready um, to ship. But let me tell you a little bit more about paper specific question answering. If you do a search on Semantic Scholar and you come to what we call a paper detail page where we tell you a lot about the paper, um, you can open the paper in the semantic region uh, reader. And also you can see on this upper right hand side, you can ask questions, you can ask any question, but common questions, um, we make it so it's a single button click to get to that question. Um, uh, this is what we've got in the product today. I'll show you a little bit about something we think is even better. Um, and that is trying to, again, we're trying to make it easier for people to ask questions and to verify the answers very, very quickly. Um, because sometimes the AI does, does make mistakes. Um, the question is really, um, you know, is the researcher more, more efficient overall? Um, so, uh, with our new system, you can select any piece of text or click some piece of text, which we think uh, we've pre-identified as question worthy. So here, uh, some things are underlined. If you click on double quantitization, we um, pop up a little menu, which um, we automatically compute the question we think you're most likely to ask, but you can also um, click on a define what that is or a tell me more um, button and so on. You click on one of these, uh, in this case, define, and we expand out and write in the context of the text you're reading, uh, we can tell you more about what double quantization is. Um, and um, again, AI sometimes does make mistakes, not nearly as much in the context of a paper and not with the latest models, but we provide this symbol down in the bottom, the little quote mark. If you click on that, we automatically go into the paper and extract um, and pop up something that shows um, why we think this is the correct answer. Um, so you can read it and verify that the system got it right very, very quickly. Furthermore, if you look in the upper right, you can also click on see in the paper, in which case we pop up the paper and automatically highlight the text where this came from. So now you can read the text in the overall context of the paper, um, which uh, makes sure that we're not taking something out of context um, and so on. This is part of something we call the semantic reader. I'll come back to um, in just a minute. Um, so moving on to the last section, um, reading. Um, we did a number of studies of people reading technical papers. None of this will be surprising to you. People found it to be incredibly tiring uh, process. And we also noticed people were flipping back and forth in the paper, for example, checking citations, checking definitions. Um, as a result, we built a system called the Semantic Reader, um, which is in production on Semantic Scholar. It's also led to a large number of research papers. Again, I'm only gonna talk about a very small set of features here. So I'll talk about these two systems. Um, this shows our automatic definition. So you're reading through a technical paper, you can't remember what the heck K is. Um, if you um, click on K, it pops up the definition, which in this case is the, the number of clusters. Um, and uh, it tells you where it comes from. You can click on that and see the definition in context if you want. So automatic term and symbol definitions. Similarly with citations, we can pop those up. Um, and then the final feature, which is a little bit more um, science fiction-y, um, um, is AI-powered skimming. So if you turn on skimming in the reader, we automatically highlight the text that we think is uh, most salient and important. And you're free to read anything, but we're drawing your attention to what we think is the most um, important text. And there's all sorts of, we also throw it up in a sidebar on the right. We found a number of participants actually preferred to read sort of the Reader's Digest um, condensed version of the paper in the sidebar. Um, and then when they found something interesting, they would just click on it and it would automatically show them that part of the paper. 
um, there's a set of controls that let you um, decide how many highlights to show and which kinds of highlights to show. Um, and um, uh, and let's see, I'll continue. So um, in, in summary, um, I think one thing that's very important with AI is to seek tools that include attribution and verification. Um, so the ability, for example, in question answering to quickly see where the answer came from and to verify that in the context of the actual paper. Um, uh, and then I guess the second thing, I um, think corpus question answering really has the potential to make transformational advances in efficiency, but um, in our experience, it's not quite ready for, for prime time. Um, Paper-specific question answering, um, I think, is much more mature. Um, and that's it. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. That was a great presentation. So we'll move to our third speaker. Um, Gwen Nguyen, I, I think you're on. I, th I think I saw you. Um, so uh, Gwen Nguyen is a intramural investigator at NIH Nursing Research. Uh, she's a soci social epidemiologist focusing on contextual and economic factors as they relate to health. She leverages technology and big data sources to investigate and address health disparities. We're so happy to have you here, Gwen. Well, thank you so much for the invitation. And I really enjoyed the, the last few talks. I'm learning a lot. And so I'm going to presenting uh, present a few more examples. Let's see. Oh, yes, so sorry. OK, so um, as a little background, I come from a research perspective. Uh, over the last 11 years, I've worked as a faculty at University of Utah and University of Maryland, uh, receiving three grants each five years uh, long. And all of the grants incorporate uh, data science or AI for use in health outcomes research. So the latest project that we're working on, and I recently trans, uh, transferred to the National Institute of Nursing Research, um, and uh, this project is just a use case where we're creating a AI-powered question and answer chatbot for parenting and pregnant moms with young infants. So this is a highly risk kind of adverse setting where the information presented could affect a decision making and used by the mom to make decisions about her own pregnancy, postpartum, and infant care. Um, so the way we work in this setting is uh, one major thing is restricting the source documents. So only to American Academy of Pediatrics, CDC, um, children's hospitals, and the like, and that has helped really um, uh, lower the risk. Of Okay, so in terms of scientific assessment, I see a few potential uh, strengths, and they have also been highlighted in previous talks. So, scalability, you know, with acknowledgement of the and of the you know the exponential growth in publications, it's hard for any team to really sift through uh, this giant uh, list. For instance, a, a study found 130,000 international peer-reviewed articles published on climate change in 1991 and 2021. Um, uh, as researchers, we dealt with this issue too. Um, so I did computer vision on neighborhood uh, images. If we were to do this manually, we could only do a few neighborhoods, but we wanted national patterns. So uh, when you're trying to tackle the scale, and the hope is that by increasing the scale, you reduce bias, um, because when you're sampling a, a sum from of it, you might actually introduce some bias because it might miss some key elements. So you might get scale um, in terms of one benefit. Also, performance, especially if you're uh, targeting simple uh, tasks that are that you have the metric for that you know exactly what you want, and if they're bottlenecks, especially, so the tool can potentially be developed to provide you with consistent uh, classification and lower error rates, potentially more so than human annotators can. Uh, the result is hopefully some time savings that you can have to do really precise and efficient searches based upon your inclusion exclusion criteria and then the ability to evaluate trends over time, topics and geographies. However, there is of course limitations and potential uh, pitfalls. Um, one major that's also been introduced is the perpetuation bias, something that you know we're all concerned about. Um, so if there's underrepresentation of certain groups in the training data or certain aspects, um, this can lead to incorrect predictions for these groups are for that aspect of the data that it didn't see in training. Um, outputs can discriminate based upon, especially you will be concerned about vulnerable populations. Um, also considering uh, 
uh, real world data. So we know there's residential segregation, we know there's discrimination, you know, by in healthcare, housing, employment. If we just feed it real world data, you might build a system that replicates real world bias. So uh, when designing an AI system, you would want to have, uh, you know, your principles and values in place, what you want it to do, what the eventual output, um, and then measure that in its output and its design. Okay, so when you're thinking about an AI system, you'd also want to have enough time and resource investment, uh, uh, sufficient training data. So the models are pre-trained, but you might want additional fine tuning um, for based on your use case, uh, staff members, and sufficient computational resources, and the time set aside for really developing and fine tuning these tools for your specific use case quality control checks, and of course, maintenance of these systems. It's also not guaranteed that the error rate will be lower, um, especially if the model is not trained appropriately. And some tasks might be too complicated for current AI systems. One way to kind of tackle that one is to break up the complicated tasks into little tasks, and then really try to evaluate the performance of each little task to make it really tight and have high accuracy. Uh, uh, that was a wonderful talk about Somatic Scholar. There is great literature review tools now that can help you with some of the workflow, identify relevant papers, topic summaries, visualizations. There's also, of course, uh, the skimming tool that uh, I think there have been research into that actually helping you retain and really understand information. Okay, there's also data analysis tools, uh, of course. Uh, and then um, potential different components you might consider. Um, for scientific assessment, so uh, building a system that retrieves relevant literature. So you're, this is going to need expert guidance because what is relevant for your use case. So you want to define what, what you want to consider as a relevant body of literature. Um, and then an AI tool potentially to help you with eligibility or, or inclusion exclusion um, decisions because that is a very tedious and uh, large tasks that you have before you. Lots of publications, how do you evaluate which ones to include um, and which ones to exclude? Uh, a building an interactive library for your use case, um, class, uh, being able to organize it by year or top, especially for topics. So for instance, um, I was reading through uh, the last report and there are different themes like air pollution, extreme events, vector-borne diseases. So you would have expert guidance in um, people annotating various literature for these topics. So you were able to feed the model, okay, this study, these sets of studies on air pollution, these sets of studies on extreme events. And so the model can learn to really accurately identify um, uh, these, uh, these topics in your literature. And this can scale up. So you can kind of start to classify hundreds of thousands of articles rather than doing that manually. Um, and then question answering. So not the, the you won't, because you won't be using the AI to write the report, but you might use it to help you get a, to answer questions about a specific paper or about a particular theme. Um, so in regards to training data, so the training data that, that you feed it uh, should be gold standard, so contain uh, truth. Um, and the data should be of uh, breadth, such that it encounters the range of, uh, of possibilities that you are going to use it on. Um, and then if there are data gaps, so if you recognize, okay, these uh, uh, there are shortcomings in the training data that you have, you have a plan for how to arrive at training data so it recognizes uh, certain rare cases um, so that it knows what to do rather than extra extrapolate for those cases if you don't provide enough training data. Um, for text summarization, this is highlighted in the past for where things can get riskier because there's potential for hallucinations when the A model produces incorrect, misleading, or illogical results. So especially in cases where it does, where it's training and it's starting to see a edge case or a case that it hasn't really been trained on, it might make extrapolations that are incorrect. Um, and then you want, of course, the AI to generate only valid and verifiable information. So uh, we, in, in our in our evaluation for Rosie, we break it down a little further to, uh, to for these two things. So uh, we break the test into two components. One, uh, the user asks a question, the model will start to retrieve relevant source documents, only the source documents that we provided as uh, verifiable and valid from sources. And then it starts to construct the answers. And there's, there's an evaluation, a manual evaluation phase uh, uh, where we we evaluate whether all of her responses are grounded in the source documents only. So we're really trying to put guardrails in, in her uh, response to users. 
equity considerations. So this is emerging, you know, line of research. A lot of the tools right now are English language based, but there are uh, emerging tools for multilingual to ingest and summarize literature in multiple languages. Tools can be made and dockerized, so they can be packaged and then shared with your collaborators. Um, and then you, the outputs can be evaluated for potential desperate impacts, especially on vulnerable populations. So uh, in summary, um, AI might really help you be very efficient at processing large amounts of data into manageable insights, but it can't full, fully replace or grasp um, he, uh, nuances, real world implications, biases, and unintended consequences the way humans can. So I see the opportunity really is trying to relieve some bottlenecks, at least in the initial stages of your workflow, um, to kind of get them, well, you know, greater scale accuracy and consistency on those initial steps. Um, and when you're building your AI system, and um, emphasize simplicity. So only really focus on the things that you want, essential items you want to get done. Um, and this will save time in development and cost as well as simple systems are easier to use. So it'll be more user friendly. Um, I acknowledge, I want to acknowledge my collaborators from University of Maryland. Thank you, Quinn. We are very sorry to see you go. <laughs> so um, I, I'd like uh, to introduce our fourth speaker, um, Dr. Kawadaji, who is a research fellow at Imperial College London. He's, uh, he's, uh, his research focuses on the integrated assessment models, um, their multidisciplinary application and data analytics to explore climate mitigation strategies. His interest encompasses very various mitigation approaches, including carbon and capture and storage and carbon dioxide removal technologies. Dr. Um, Kawadaji, we're very happy to have you here. Thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and thanks very much uh, for having me. Um, so my talk is, is around a review paper that I started earlier this year, um, which is on the role of AI tools in scientific assessment in general, but focus on climate change. And, and the background motivation is I was, I was part of the inner circle as it were. PTC AR6 assessment. I was member of the science team in working group three uh, technical support unit. So basically, I was a little bit on a lonely journey there, asking what are how can we use these tools in order to help uh, the assessment processes in the IPCC and beyond, and what are the uh, issues that we need to be careful about. So hopefully, I'll try to summarize um, um, uh, those points. Let me just. So very briefly, I'm going to go uh, through the mandate of the IPCC, which is very similar to what was mentioned at the beginning of the session um, uh, by Ariela. Uh, and then I'm just going to touch briefly on the challenges uh, that are relevant to our discussion today for undertaking scientific assessments. Um, how can we leverage AI tools uh, for scientific synthesis? And if I'm allowed a little bit more time, uh, then I can talk a little bit about communicating scientific assessments using generative AI. So the IPCC manages to assess on comprehensive, objective, open, and transparent basis the scientific literature. And the IPCC should be neutral with respect to policy, uh, but uh, the assessment itself should be, should continue to be policy relevant, uh, although not policy prescriptive. So whatever processes we are going to follow in our assessment, we should always adhere uh, to these guiding principles. And the assessment itself is essentially to identify and communicate areas of scientific uh, consensus. And the, the methods uh, that we can use for identifying these scientific consensus very much vary by, uh, differ according to the scientific literature. So be it meta-analysis, systematic maps, weight of evidence, and so on. And collectively, hopefully, these uh, will help us maximizing the rigor of, of our uh, science um, findings, but also many by susceptibility to biases and errors from individual studies. Um, when uh, when authors or IPC authors take this assessment, uh, they need also to express uh, the, their level of confidence uh, in the findings uh, using uh, guidelines provided to these authors that determine uh, the 
uh, basically to, to provide five qualifiers for each uh, findings uh, that we that we communicate with governments. These qualifiers could be from very low or very high, and they depend very much on level of agreement in the scientific literature, but also on the type and the quality of the evidence and so on. Um, so the point I'm trying to make here really is whatever tools we use, be it now or in the future, uh, we should always ensure that we continue to adhere to these guiding principles of the scientific assessment. And if we are to use tools to synthesize IPCC assessment reports or other assessment reports, then we should make sure that this communication to preserve the confidence level that we have in these scientific findings. So this is really the underlying motivation of, of this talk, uh, or of this exploration that I uh, in, uh, in this. Um, so uh, in terms of challenges uh, to, uh, to undertaking, uh, of undertaking scientific assessments uh, of, of relevance to our uh, discussion today, uh, I do Challenges. One is the exponential growth and increasing complexity of scientific literature. Uh, so you can see, for instance, here, each assessment cycle, the daily rate of publication relevant to climate change has doubled. And since the publication of the R6 report, there has been 135 papers published each day on, uh, on this topic. Uh, to put it differently, for instance, as mentioned, in, in one of the interventions, in AR5, the IPCC has assessed over 20% of relevant publications to specific, which I don't recall what was uh, at the moment, but uh, that's, an, that's one important statistic. Or to put it also differently, a few days ago, uh, Manfred et al. published a preprint uh, where they show that the IPCC AR6 covered only 4.6% of research related to human settlement. So it's indeed a very low rate of, of assessment to, to kind of adhere to the comprehensive uh, element of, uh, of the IPCC mandate. One challenge, another challenge is uh, communicating the increasingly lengthy IPCC report. Uh, so AR6, we managed to produce successfully 12,000 pages of report I counted uh, myself. And of course, this raises challenges of accessing the underlying detailed evidence beyond the summaries that we produce uh, to communicate with, with the public and the policymakers and the dissemination of important scientific findings that do not merit uh, to these summaries. Um, so if I will summarize uh, this in, in a made up schematic, uh, have two challenges the exponential growth of in increasing complexity of scientific literature that feeds into all these reports, and this is the IPCC AR6 report, and then the dissemination of all these uh, scientific findings uh, to, the, uh, to the public and the policymakers. So what are the tools uh, that we can uh, use? Um, we all agree in this room that uh, in this meeting that ChatGPT is certainly not one of these tools. Uh, although while we agree, uh, I'm part of a UNEP assessment, a GEO7, and uh, uh, the, uh, the ChatGPT came out halfway through our assessment, and uh, the secretariat felt the need for, uh, for issuing guidelines against the use of ChatGPT. So perhaps they do have an evidence of use ChatGPT for the assessment, and this is something we need to guard against. Uh, go back to what we do usually do in these assessments, which is systematic uh, literature uh, review, um, uh, be it systematic uh, maps or evidence maps that uh, catalog the available evidence uh, on, uh, on, a, uh, on a broad topic and categorize uh, this, uh, the landscape of research in a specific field. But in this case, we, have, we can enhance, uh, we can have uh, this process enhanced uh, using AI tools uh, uh, so that we can uh, a large, much larger volume of the literature than would be possible. Um, so in the preprint uh, that uh, Stephen uh, uh, distributed as part of the agenda for this meeting, I've reviewed different approaches uh, to undertake this, uh, but what I'm going to be to summarize them briefly. So they are summarized in, this table, uh, in the preprint. But the way I'm going to summarize this presentation is unpacking the common elements and the characteristics. So the common elements here, they all rely on using AI ML tools uh, that uh, to handle large uh, data sets of the literature. And it's important, important to note that uh, the different tools that we use for handling the different uh, 
vary depending on the type of the literature. So different type of literature have spatial characteristics or temporal characteristics, and the ML tools that we need to use uh, for dealing with that kind of, with this different kind of literature uh, need to kind of help us uh, capturing these characteristics of literature. But generally, they are uh, natural language-based, uh, unsupervised ML uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, they follow specific research criteria and machine learning classifiers. And as I said, these classifiers could be based on regional aspects, temporal aspects, uh, or topic aspects. Uh, some of them, uh, they use word occurrences to identify certain clusters in the literature. And these are typically scalable and automated, so they help fast tracking workflow and the different practices that I've seen in the literature, essentially starting with the uh, data collection from a web of science or open Alex, uh, then some cleaning and preparing uh, the text data for analysis, um, and then uh, the use of uh, AI or machine learning analysis, such as, um, uh, such as topic modeling, classification, uh, to process this vast corpse of the literature. And in some cases, uh, there is also a degree of ex involvement and that helps uh, hopefully refining uh, the results that was found using this workflow but also provide additional analyses and increasing the analytical depth of of the uh, of the uh, body of the literature that we find using uh, the from evidence or topographic maps to thematic clusters. So here I'm providing for instance a, an example on demand sign mitigation uh, where the literature on housing, uh, food, supply, nature, and so on, uh, or it could be content-based insights or living databases. So a paper that came out a few days ago, or a preprint came out a few days ago, uh, that, uh, that has actually a living database of uh, literature related to cities to feed into the upcoming IPCC uh, assessment uh, report. And the visualization, as you can see here, can, uh, can help us identify these clusters. The issue of uh, the potential biases, uh, incomplete coverage of topics uh, the, which depend on the used uh, database, uh, geographical uh, biases, for instance, or cultural biases. However, as discussed already in the meeting, arguably we already suffer from uh, these issues. Uh, limitation to English language literature, which is something that against the rising importance of involving indigenous knowledge and local knowledge. Uh, expertise engagement uh, require fur further incentives uh, to make sure that they are part of the process, but also there are equity considerations that need to be at the forefront. So important to avoid discouraging scientists not engaging uh, uh, with these kind of tools from participating in the entire process. And also when we're dealing with, uh, in the case of the IPCC, we deal with Global South authors uh, and these tools require constant internet access, which might not be readily available in different parts of the world. Um, so questions uh, that perhaps the scientific uh, uh, com uh, community and the assessment community could think about is uh, a mapping of the different tools and uh, methods uh, that can assist in the assessment of different types of the literature and that co could operate differently at different stages of the assessment process. Uh, whether it's necessary to update the guiding principle of assessment processes to preserve the integrity of the scientific assessment processes, and uh, what is the ideal workflow for an expert-led AI-supported assessment to preserve, again, the integrity of IPCC, uh, of, of any scientific assessments. I have a very, very short section on, on communicating assessment reports uh, using uh, large language models. I'm going to go through that fairly quickly unless I get different signal from Stephen. Um, I see, I see I can, I can go ahead. Two minutes and then we'll go into question and answer. Right, thanks. Um, right, so uh, there are a lot of attempts of going uh, out to see our six reports in chatbots and chatbots so that people can use uh, uh, these chat uh, the reports. Um, so uh, here I've Show an example, chatclimate.ai. Uh, they have they trained the chatbot uh, standalone on AR6 assessment report. Uh, they trained it, uh, well, they had its own GPT-4 knowledge and they did a hybrid uh, hybrid mode. And 
what's interesting is that in the uh, in the standalone and the hybrid approach, it actually preserves the uh, the confidence language that is important outcome of the assessment process. What is uh, the problem here is that it continued to resynthesize the information from the corpse of the report. So the language that we're looking at here is not verbatim from the IPCC report, and this is something important to keep in mind. Uh, of course, uh, this is surprising because uh, these large language models don't understand language, they don't have grasp scientific concept, they're pattern recognizer, and the pattern uh, uh, spotting mechanism results in different answers for the same prompt. Uh, they do resynthesize the assessment, and as others mentioned, there are issues around hallucination and misinformation, and there are some biases that may influence policy advice. Uh, I'm not going to go through that, uh, but if, uh, if the assessment community, and this is my last slide, uh, to consider whether or not uh, LLMs can be part of the suite of tools or, out, uh, or products for assessment reports, then uh, my thinking is that these large language models should operate as smart search tool with zero tolerance for re-synthesizing uh, the assessment that we already uh, worked on. Uh, there should be a retrieval hierarchy so that the summary of a policymaker should be the first input into the answers all the way through the chapter, a detailed chapter text. Uh, there should be a return of full paragraphs verbatim because that's part of the outcome of the assessment process, and this required a very customized development of these LLMs deeply integrated in the uh, assessment drafting and review process. Uh, we'll here. Thank you very much. That was a great talk. So we have all four of our speakers, plus Dave, still on the line, and I'm going to open it up for questions, but I'm going to start with Jane because I cut you off in an earlier session. So I'll start with Jane and then if you raise your hand, I'll, I'll grab you on the screen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna add an addendum to my original question. So I thought that um, Dave and Ariella, you began to address this, but um, there might be a, t I wonder if there might be a tendency to compare use of AI tools with the ideal for the assessments rather than a kind of a acknowledgement of what is likely currently the case. And, you know, acceptance of using the tools might be every, I think we all acknowledge that even people are biased and that I think the question is, is our tools doing a better or worse job of that or providing a check and kind of engaging with users and stakeholders on that question, but it does, there's also sort of a risk in acknowledging where the current processes don't meet those ideals. And I wonder if you, I mean, you've spoken to us about it, but it might need to be something more formal and whether you've thought about that. And then the second question is really, um, goes to this question about black box, you know, black box models and their, and how that relates to trustworthiness. And this is an example of a little knowledge being dangerous, but I listened to a podcast yesterday that talked about how Anthropic has been experimenting with being able to break open their, their one or more of their models and, and be able to see clusters of what are actually influencing the results. And this might be kind of a technical question, but as this evolves, is there potential for being able to see more clearly into the black box for understanding where these risks may lie, or at least being able to explain in a way that a human might be able to. Okay, so model. do we have each one uh, or the two speakers referred to quick answers and, and then we'll go, I have a whole list of hands as they've come up. So, so Dave, did you or Dan, did you want to? Um, sure. Um, I, I guess I would say um, I think people are black boxes, and all the cognitive science literature shows that um, we tend to answer questions and do things not in the way that we think we do. All this talk about system one and system two reasoning, we um, react instinctively, and then we justify it afterwards. System two. Um, 
my I am a big fan of research on explainable AI, but um, I wouldn't hold out any hope that we're going to understand really what's going inside, you know, 70 billion or larger models. It's just too complicated. Thank you. OK, so I'm going to go Phil, Karen, Joel and Julie, because that's the order your hands came up. Could you please make an effort to make your questions pretty succinct and to the point? So, Phil? So we um, get lost. Thanks. In. This was a really great session. Uh, and Allah, I think the movie was better than the book. Appreciated your paper and the presentation was great. My question maybe is mostly for Dan, but really for anybody. If I were in Ariella's shoes, I would want to think about not just what the tools are, but how can I ensure that my authors are coached in using them effectively? So are there some sort of general guidelines on um, this sort of evidence mapping approach or how to do sophisticated literature searches. I would imagine that th it's possible to do really dumb approaches and probably some authors will not get beyond doing dumb things. Some might not even try because it's too intimidating. So. Um, I'm not sure if I've got a good answer there. I feel like I should, but I don't. Anyone else have a or Allah or I think, really? uh, Thank you. Um, I mean, I, I haven't haven't yet seen a synthesis, so to speak, or an assessment of the different tools and how they can operate for different type of literature and at different stages of the assessment process. So I, I was actually hoping that this is one of the meetings and one of the discussions that kickstart this process where assessment the assessment community, such as us, uh, work closely with AI community to 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 do this kind of mapping, um, and then for the assessment community to to ensure that the guardrails are, are are there, that such that we ensure the integrity of the assessment. Um, so I'm I'm sorry, it's it's a very important question, it's something I'm I'm trying to read on and find the answer for, but uh, it it will take a community effort to get there. Okay, Karen. Yeah, you stole my thunder because I was <laughs> asked almost the same question, but just to push that a little. Uh, so I'm Karen. I've got to introduce Karen Fisher Van in Penn State University. Um, maybe this is a question more for the USGCRP. Will there be training? Because it really is true that I mean, I I think I'm pretty dumb at using these AI tools, and just hearing these you know these speakers here, um, there seems to be a lot out there that I'm unaware of, and there's a real skill to it. You know, it's more of an art than a science. So I, I, maybe this is a question for UC, uh, US uh, PRCP to, um, to tell us what, maybe what they're thinking in that way. What kind of training or guidance documents would be available? I think that that is the question is how would we train people to ask those good questions? I, I, um, I had a very similar question as, you know, when you put parameters into any of these tools of what you want in a lit review back, what is the best practice and how do you as a researcher know what the um what the training set is how do you know how to ground truth which journals are being taken from and so i think there's a sort of a mix of what i've heard is that it's a we have to help create the tools that we want to use in the way that we use them but i think we would need some guidance on that question that dan was was re responding to that you know there are no yet there are no best practices yet there's a multitude of different ways and i kept thinking would we give guidance across all chapters is each chapter approaching it in the same way there's 32 chapters and they have different queries and they have things they're looking for and the biases in their own respective literatures are different and so how do you sort of overcome those things and i think these are the things that we need to really think deeply about in order to create a training that would be meaningful and useful. And I, I think that's part of our hesitancy to jump you know, in full hog because I don't know the answers to these questions yet. Alal? Yeah, if I may come on this one. So I, I am currently working with uh, the IPCC Bureau from Working Group 2 to answer this question. And one of the models or one of the approaches that we came up with is to have an AI officer or expert in the technical support unit that figure out the technical aspects, but they work closely with the coordinating lead author of trying to help the coordinating lead author. This, this is the outline of our chapters. These are the keywords that we are interested in. 
how can we extract literature that uh, can address the keywords that uh, will help us answering the outline of our chapters. As far as I'm concerned, this is my thinking around it, um, but it will be an iterative process. There will be, you know, th th there will be approaching it different ways. Uh, different chapters will have different keywords. Uh, so, so it will be scalable, hopefully. The AI and the machine learning uh, workflow, hopefully should be applicable to all the different chapters. So it should be scalable on industrial scale process uh, in, in, in a sense. Um, uh, but then how this process will evolve uh, with the review process and the second order draft, third order draft, that that's, that's something I think we, as the next assessment cycle, AR7 or the NSA and so on coming up, this is something we need to learn on, on the go, I'm afraid. That's my thing. Okay, so Dan, very quickly. Um, yeah, I mean, the one other thing just to point out, if you haven't talked already with people at the Cochrane Institute who do systematic reviews for medicine and have been using AI in their workflows for quite some time, I would absolutely reach out with them. There's tools perhaps you can share, but certainly best practices. Okay, so we have Joel next, and then Julie, and then Miriam. Okay, so I want to make begin with an observation. And uh, Ariella is am I pronouncing correctly? Or... Ariella. Okay, thank you. Um, sorry, um, but you have my uh, congratulations and sympathies for. <laughs> <laughs> the challenge that you and your team face. I think the two biggest challenges for NCAs, given the environment, and I, let's be frank, political environment you operate in, is tone and comprehensiveness. You know, what tone do you does the report put out? How comprehensive is the literature? I've seen good and bad examples. Be happy to chat with you offline about those over the years since I've had involvement one way or another in almost all of the assessments. Um, and then Relating to AI, I don't know if AI can help us much in terms of tone. It certainly can in terms of comprehensiveness and in terms of, because that's also a question of what's out there, but also the quality of what's out there, right? And how to judge that. I'm curious though, and I was really struck by Dr. Zhu's, the simple example with your with your son. And it, it strikes me that this is a, it has to, or is it, does it need to be an interactive process where we use AI, figure out what works well, figure out what doesn't, figure out how to train it. And I was struck with um, Allah's uh, answer about this uh, sort of information officer working with AI. And are, is that, are there good examples of using AI in assessments such as this, good models that NCA could follow um, that, you know, may help? Because in a way, I, part of the problem is we're, you know, building the airplane point is we're flying it. So thanks. Thank you. Okay, we'll go to Julie V. Um, I was asking very similar questions, so I'll just defer and let somebody else ask the next. Okay, Miriam, and then Kimberly, and then Julie. Thank you, everyone, uh, everyone for your wonderful presentations. Um, so as I'm understanding, AI will, will work to include more similar data into these, like to an, analyze data that is formatted in a way that AI can seep through, right? So I'm thinking more of um, papers or even different styles of information, right? Like we, the semantic scholar that what Dan Weld talked to us about was very like, this is, these are the aims, the goal, the method, blah, blah, blah. But what happens when a paper is not written in, in that way? What happens when it's a much more qualitative, um, paper where it might not be so clear uh, how to retrieve the data in that sense, right? Like um, so there's just different types of um, ways that we communicate data. So what, how um, can, or is, is that a, a something that AI can do already with thinking more about just like different type of data in, found, I guess, right now in text? Um. I would say um, that th th that's a place where AI is not going to do as well. One, if you can identify the different data, then of course you can adapt or fine tune the AI so that it will work on that that other data. Um, but it is dependent on what you train on. So I would think of the AI as helping in the places where it works well, but it's not a panacea. You can only 
it's going to hopefully save time so that humans have time to look at that other data and spend more time on that on the places where the AI is not as helpful. So I want to add on to that question just real quickly, and I'm sorry I'm jumping in line, but it seems to me there's an interaction between specification and discovery that all of you all have have alluded to in your presentations. And I would ask you, what would be a principle for covering the issue of specification and discovery, that interaction, if you were, do you have a sense of what kind of principle you could use to do that at the early end of looking for, for information? Um, I think what the Cochrane Institute does is they spend quite a bit of time formulating a Boolean query um, and then uh, they, they double check that and then all the papers that are returned by that Boolean query are considered to be in scope and then uh, a combination of AI classifiers and humans go through to determine uh, which of those actually count or not. So that's a, sort of an emphasis of high recall, getting everything, or at least having a chance to get everything, because there's human errors in there as well. Um, but uh, with a well-defined reproducible criteria, um, that's what they do. And I think there's lots of merits to that. Um, contrast that with our recommendation system, which use a, a deep neural um, system based on embeddings. It's harder to characterize exactly what papers are being returned by that. On the other hand, our, our experience is that it's the, um, the precision tends to be higher, so you get fewer false negatives, so it saves saves time. I think there's trade-offs between those two approaches. I'm not sure what's best for you. Thank you, Dr. Hu. Yes. Um, so you mentioned about specification, and I think specification, you know, the challenge you are actually indicating is a fundamental question about can we train the current generation AI to know or to model humans' common sense or our intuitions? And sometimes I think this is challenging. I don't think the scientific community find the answer or solution yet. My own uh, answer to that question is no, we are not. We're not able to, you know, model a person's hunch, right? For a lot of research and discovery, there are a little bit, you know, especially scientific assessment when you try to deal with, okay, why this stream of literature has inconsistency or even conflicting with other literature. Sometimes we have these hunches, right? And try to look into underlying patterns or assumptions we are not holding. And, you know, AI may have the capacity and magical power to identify something we cannot see. But meanwhile, how we communicate with this super genius that do not share common sense with us? Do we have a language to specify what we want so that the machine learning models which are good at optimization, optimization can understand, right? We operation, we are not, you know, human beings researchers are not just single-minded optimizers, but AIs are built for that. So, so these, you know, how to align what we are thinking with the models are thinking, it's a huge challenge. I don't know. So the yeah, fundamental okay. question is, can we model common sense? If we can model human common sense, then we're getting there. Thank you very much. Kimberly and then Julie. Thank you. Um, I should turn my camera on after get with the... Um, so my question, which may have been kind of addressed in a way, but it occurs to me as AI models evolve, they're evolving more quickly than we're typically used to scientific tools evolving, right? And so how do you continue to be efficient in how you use AI when AI itself is changing so rapidly? So what are some guidelines we could think of? Because you, you think about in the NCA process, right? And I just read, and it was very helpful to read kind of the, the um, appendix for how you developed and use the data before. But if you incorporate AI, I would think you would have to change how you kind of determine what to use really quickly, if that makes sense. So how would you, yeah, I guess my question is, how might we think about doing that in a way that's, that keeps, you know, so you're not using an old AI tool because, you know, months later, it's now able to do something it couldn't do when you first try to evaluate it. Alal? Yeah, mindful of time. The short answer is having an AI expert as part of the technical support unit team and the assessment 
itself um, to keep an eye on these kind of development and how can they be useful for the for the authors and the assessment process. But I think I think what Kim is asking, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that you you, you might have an AI officer, but the technology is emerging and potentially producing different answers as the technology continues to evolve. So that AI person is going to have the same issue as the scientist who's using the tool. Um, uh, I guess I guess it depends on what we're using it for. If we're using it to to ex extrapolate uh, the literature um, from uh, from databases, uh, then I'm, I'm not sure, and please other, other colleagues here, correct me if I'm wrong, that this will change much with the advancement of the AI tools. Uh, but if we are using large language models to communicate the, uh, the report or the literature, then this definitely will change. But um, um, my understanding is that the interest here is the former rather than the latter. Gwen? Um, we have had this experience as well when we were building Rosie the chatbot. You know, uh, it's we're in year four of Rosie, so that, as you can imagine, the technology has changed. What is helpful is a uh, constant interaction with the model and the data, so you actually know what it's doing. You can try new tools, see what it's doing with your data, what outputs it's producing. So it's really not you know leading the tool on its own, but really interaction and playing in in like helping design the system, test out the system. So. And then putting guardrails in, in uh, and then having really clear uh, idea and conclusions about what you want out of the AI, like your goals, like very specific tasks that you want done. Um, and then just hone in on those tasks and evaluate how well the AI is performing on those tasks. Um, for, I think, uh, in risk averse settings, attribution is key. So when you have AI surfacing, any literature or summaries you want, you can ask it to uh, provide attribution. So uh, force it to, that's what we're doing. So when it provides a, a response to users, it will attribute its statements. And then you can, and then it, you also, but you also need to evaluate whether its attributions are correct and um, make sure all of the, the facts are grounded in the source document. So there are ways to do that and to make sure those guardrails are in place when you're using it. Good. Thank you very much. Okay, Julie, you're our last question. It's a lot of pressure when you're standing between lunch. Um, I'll go quick. Uh, yeah, I think just a couple of things I wanted to, I think we've talked about it and Hang really brought up of just kind of naming clearly that, you know, we talked about uh, biases and common sense, but also if we think about um, intuition as kind of the baseline for all knowledge of how are we thinking about the, the human intuition in these tools and as thinking about practices, really thinking about the morality and ethics. And, you know, something um, the, the speaker is going to be thinking about was, uh, and from earlier, and this maybe more for the GCRP team, but you know, in the as policies were created around, you know, at the same time, significant butting head kind of tensions between the okay policies around the integration of indigenous knowledges, while also this call for open science and open data, right? And explicitly the, the tensions created there. And it seems really worthwhile. Now you insert kind of AI as this triangulation. Um, and I'd imagine, and these conversations might already be happening, but speaking with the folks who were leading some of that push for the open science and data, maybe some of the things they wished were under consideration um, and things that came up after the fact, right? And recognizing these tensions, there could be a lot of, I think, lessons learned through those processes that might help inform um, as we think about the AI guidance here. I think that's our our last, uh, our last question or comment for the day. Um, I wanna thank our speakers, the five of you for taking the time to talk with us. It, the presentations were really terrific and very, very helpful. So thank you very much. And um, we look forward to talking with you further. Thank you. And with that, we'll break for lunch.
All right, welcome back from lunch, everybody. So it is my delightful task to moderate this afternoon's session. Um, in the morning, we had some really useful um, practical insights into the use of AI uh, as, uh, in ways that may be pertinent for scientific assessment. We also heard from Dave about the structure and function of the National Climate Assessment uh, process and places that AI could could play a role. Um, in the, this afternoon, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to go sort of next level uh, principles and requirements for authoritative, useful, trusted scientific assessments. So we have speakers from a range of backgrounds. Um, the first session is going to be overview and considerations, then we'll break into um, small groups uh, to, for further discussions and Sarah will give us guidance on that, and then we'll come back and we'll hear insights from other organizations and agencies. So for this first session, uh, we have three speakers and 30 minutes. So that's, uh, we we'll ask each speaker to stick to about seven or eight minutes so that we have a few minutes at the end for questions for all of them. Um, so I will introduce them uh, one at a time. So the first speaker is Katie Shilton. Um, Katie is a professor in the College of Information at the University of Maryland College Park. Her research focuses on, on technology and data ethics. She received a BA from Oberlin, Master of Library and Information Science from UCLA, and a PhD in Information Science Studies from UCLA. Uh, take it away, Katie. Thank you. All right, let me share my screen here. Okay, I'm really pleased to be here. And I have uh, slides that are a little bit, uh, they have a lot of information on them. I'm going to go through them quickly, but they, I'm hoping they will be available to you. They have some discussion questions, some heuristics that I hope will be helpful. Um, so I am involved in a couple of um, uh, university-wide collaborations with colleagues in computer science and philosophy and information that are really focused on mapping human and organizational values to AI. Um, and so today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the heuristics. This is sort of just one outcome of these projects um, about have been heuristics and exercises that are aimed at making AI adoption decisions that center human values. So we get these questions a lot, you know, when should we use AI in XY organization? Um, I've spoken to other open science uh, fa uh, foundations, things like that, who are asking very similar questions. Um, and so what I'm going to talk about today is mapping principles, um, which, you know, you have very clear examples of, um, to AI capabilities and challenges. Um, and then mapping where breakdowns are likely to occur with AI tools and whether there are avenues for repair. Um, and I think these are two just really important things. So we'll start with values and then we'll talk about uh, breakdown and repair. So I'm gonna suggest that the first activity or a first activity, you have many activities, but a first activity is trying to think about some of the values and principles that have already been established for the US GCRP, um, how they might be either supported by or challenged by AI tools. So, you know, one of the challenges here is that AI is not in any way a monolith, right? We might be talking about uh, classifiers um, and, you know, prediction, but often when people sort of ask about AI, they're talking about generative AI in various sorts. So I have today done this exercise with sort of generative AI tools in mind, uh, but it's worth thinking through for classifiers and more traditional forms of machine learning as well. Um, and so these principles I have on the left are ones that I have taken from um, materials um, you know, provided by USGCRP, but you might think of these values as these are uh, fairly narrow. You might the project clearly has other values as well. So, you know, but we start with sort of the values and principles that we know. Um, and it's worth thinking through ways in which Gen AI might support these values, various Gen AI tools, and of course there are many different tools. I'll, I'll have I have some mappings of those in a minute, um, as well as challenges. So, for instance, and I'm not going to walk all the way through these today, but this is I think an activity that I hope. Uh, with your expert knowledge, you might undertake, um, which is to start thinking about, so, you know, applicability and utility. Sources are important, relevant, and useful for its intended audience. All right, that's something what we want. 
So Gen AI could support this, this principle by potentially, potentially expanding access to peer review, to gray literature, to expert and local knowledge, right? Uh, using AI-enabled search, for instance, um, or um, machine translation tools to access um, things that might not be, for instance, in English. Um, things like that might expand access. Um, and tools, Gen AI tools might potentially provide accessibility of dense scientific reports to broader audiences through things like generating automatic podcasts or uh, generating chatbots and things like that. So those are potential supports. At the same time, Gen AI fundamentally challenges this principle by obscuring its sources in many, many cases, right? Uh, this is starting to improve in things like Gen AI search engines. Um, you know, Google is starting to show you the sources that um, uh, that come up in its search. Um, but generally, right, the way that these tools work is by uh, predicting what word comes next. That's not one that has really strong provenance. Uh, there are groups working on this. I was just at a NIST workshop earlier today uh, where there were folks talking about provenance uh, for Gen AI, uh, but it's hard to do right now. All right, so um, I won't spend a lot more time here, but this is the kind of example where we start to, you know, map what these tools are good at and what they're not good at um, with our with values of, for the organization. Um, but I don't want to suggest that this is sort of the end, because even when we have challenges, it's worth thinking about, well, are there mitigations to those challenges, right? And I want to suggest that um, it's really useful to think about adopting and adapting AI tools along two axes. One is if there are breakdowns, and there are going to be, these tools are not perfect, <laughs> not even close to perfect, how verifiable is that breakdown? Um, and by who, right? Can experts verify that breakdown easily? Can lay users uh, 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 verify that breakdown easily, right? And so if a breakdown is verifiable, perhaps it could then be redressed. And that is the other access is, is that breakdown repairable or redressable? Um, and so I think you can start to map different tools into these quadrants. Um, so for instance, meeting note-taking, right? There are some uh, AI-assisted meeting note-taking tools, which will you know take a transcription of your meeting and then do a summary for you. And meeting note-taking tools are both, if there's a breakdown, it's fairly verifiable. You can read the sign uh, and say, oh, that's a different meeting than I was at, right? That didn't work. That was not a good summary. Or yeah, that's a generally good summary, but I'm going to correct these things, right? Easily verifiable. I'm going to correct these things. The breakdown is repairable. So I think that meeting note-taking tools are like a very useful group collaborative tool. You can even imagine that these tools might surface um, other patterns in your meetings, right? Uh, maybe you notice who's not talking or uh, notice when you're not coming to consensus, things like that. But again, this breakdown is very easily verifiable and easily repairable. On the other end, on the other sort of quadrant, the not easily verifiable, not easily uh, break, uh, repairable quadrant, you have something like an explanatory chatbot to help people interpret a dense, thick report. The problem here is you know an expert might be able to see if a chatbot has you know might be easily to, could easily verify a breakdown right that you could ask a question about the report if you know the report well you would know if the chatbot's giving you uh, misinformation um, but a user a, 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 you know a, I a me as somebody outside of the report process I would not be able to do that verification right that is not an easily verifiable thing for me and it's not easily repairable for anyone uh, because that chatbot generated that that conversation once, right? Um, and so, you, yes, you may have logs of these conversations and they're having, but, you know, you would need to reach back to that person and say, sorry, I told you something. And companies are finding this out, right? As they use these chatbots, most of the time it goes well. And then occasionally you have to do a big repair when somebody gets a real deal on an air uh, airfare or uh, gets, you know, misinformation from the city of New York, right? Um, so explanatory chatbots are really in that other section. You have to be so, so careful because it's very hard to repair uh, breakdowns when they occur. And you have different things in the middle. An explanatory AI generated podcast is both easier to verify because you can listen as the expert to it before you post it. Um, and it's perhaps easier to repair when there's a mistake, you can regenerate the podcast until it is correct. Assuming it gets it correct, you know, you're kind of rolling the dice every time. Um, so, you know, this, this I think is a, a useful way of thinking through some of these challenges. 
Um, I'm going to give you some, the other thing I have here, some tools for you. There are starting to be value-centered adoption tools um, that you might consider using things like algorithmic impact assessments, um, playbooks, their uh, risk management playbooks that are being developed as part of the NIST uh, uh, risk management uh, framework process. Um, and there are even things like um, uh, sort of methods, like methods for implementing ethically aligned systems. This is Ecola. None of this work is mine, um, but I think it's all interesting and useful. Um, so these are just for your later use. And some questions uh, for you all as you're discussing today. So, you know, I really think it matters what tools you're considering and for what purposes, um, where their points of breakdown are, and then who can repair those points of breakdown when they happen. They will happen. Um, and then how those tools map to agency and process values um, and, and which stakeholders need to be consulted in order to do that, that true values mapping. So I will leave it at that uh, and take questions after the other two speakers. Okay, thank you, Katie. Uh, the next speaker is Lily Shu. Um, Lily is a computer science a scientist developing AI methods across machine learning, optimization, and causal inference for planetary health challenges, especially to address things like biodiversity con conservation. Uh, she received her PhD in computer science from Harvard University. Lily, take it away. Hi, thank you so much, Stephen. Um... So my, uh, I'll also just say I'm currently, I'm a postdoc at Oxford and then I'll start um, as an assistant professor at Columbia next year. Um, but the pitch that I wanna make um, uh, in summary is that AI is both highly inclusive and highly ignorant. And um, I'll go in the reverse order of this, talking first about some pitfalls and then possibilities. So some pitfalls um, about AI and this portion is focused specifically on large language models and generative technology. Um, so a lot of my work focuses on environmental management um, and working with biodiversity data, information about ecosystems. And let me just kind of compare, um, especially because this is relevant to the climate assessment and the nature assessment that you all are working on. So the type of um, data that is available for um, AI technology, like large language models. So ChatGPT has the entire internet of texts articles, books, some of which were, you know, obtained with uh, copyright uh, consent and some of which were not, um, consisting of 300 billion words. Dali was trained on um, almost 6 billion pairs of labeled text image um, information. But nature-based data, for example, about the presence um, and location and appearance um, of, um, of animal species um, inherently has a long tail. There's a lot of things that we have a lot of information on, and there's a much bigger range of things that we have very, very little data on. So a lot of the, the information that we need, there actually exists very little um, of that data for. And in fact, um, the IUCN uh, Red List um, has a category beyond extinct, critically uh, endangered, endangered, and so on. Um, they have this category of data deficient, and there's, um, almost 7,000 species that they've identified as data deficient. And it's not just kind of obscure species, it's very common species such as the orca, the killer whale, that they've um, marked as data deficient. And if I ask ChatGPT, what is the population of killer whales? And oh, it just tell me an answer, you know? It would just say, this is estimated at about 5,000 individuals. Um, if I asked, are killer whales endangered? Um, they said, oh, you know, just kind of, uh, Conclusively, they are considered to be a stable population globally, and they mentioned maybe this one population is endangered. Um, but really, there's a lot of um, nuance um, and considerations um, to uh, nature-based information because the dimensions of what we're considering are so extensive. We're thinking about um, our entire ecosystem. We're thinking about all the different populations of humans that are in some obscure parts of the world, and there just simply doesn't exist data on it. So ChatGPT is really good when there's just too much data out there, we just have to find a way to synthesize it, but it is not useful for context where we don't have that information in the first place. Um, and the challenge is that the things that are data deficient might also be the areas with highest need. So this is a paper from Nature Communications Biology um, that looks at some of these data deficient species and builds a machine learning model to try to predict um, what percentage of species are threatened with extinction in different parts of the world. And this is a mapping of marine species versus non-marine terrestrial species. But then when they add the little bit of data that they have about data deficient species, um, what their paper shows is that it actually changes the determination of which areas are at highest 
this threat and which areas that we need to prioritize. So this mapping of red and blue uh, shows the, the differences um, in areas that are suddenly identified as more uh, important versus less important. Um, and the conclusion um, of the paper is over half of the species we've identified to be data deficient are probably threatened with extinction. So um, um, a, a lot of the information that we can focus on are, is information that ChatGP doesn't have insight into because none of us have the data available to us. Okay, um, but not only is the data incomplete, um, it is also extremely biased. Um, so this is a paper um, that appeared at Nature as a policy forum paper um, of which I am a co-author, but led by Millie Chapman at Berkeley. Um, so this paper, um, one of our uh, conclusions um, is this, um, first of all, um, the data that is available for biodiversity specifically, so this is looking at GBIF data. Um, this data um, is disproportionately uh, available depending on wealth. So this, um, we have a lot more data in wealthy countries and wealthy areas within those countries. Um, there's, you can see um, observations of uh, geopolitics present. So in Cambodia, for example, during the period of um, the Khmer Rouge um, regime, um, during the Cambodian Civil War and the Cambodian Vietnamese War, um, the amount of data, of biodiversity data that was collected in Cambodia dramatically goes down and comes back up. So, you know, we are also not isolated from the um, potential like biases and missing data um, from uh, global war. Um, in the United States, um, we can observe um, uh, racial discrimination um, in the GBIF data. Um, so, if we look at urban areas in the US, areas that were historically redlined have about a half of the um, number of biodiversity observations as areas that were not redlined. Um, and um, in uh, focusing on Nigeria, um, you can also see a big discrepancy in the data that's available um, like uh, after um, the country gained independence from um, Great Britain. So there's just a lot of um, nuance and really the data that we have is um, is shaped by everything else that impacts society. Um, we cannot say that uh, the data is objective and understanding um, and trying to uh, bring in some of that nuance will be really helpful for undoing the bias that we have. Um, and another form of bias that is uh, specific to LLMs um, is uh, discrimination. And um, some of that discrimination um, is really subtle. So this is a nice paper um, in Nature that appeared in February of this year where they compared um, LLM um, outputs um, of standardized American English uh, versus African American English or Ebonics. Um, and the, the um, ChatGPT's um, assessment of the person speaking standard English is that they are highly intelligent and brilliant. And, the, and their assessment of the person speaking African-American English is that they are lazy and stupid, even though the content is the same. So if we are using um, LLMs to uh, search um, information available to conduct these scientific assessments, we wanna make sure that we're making, that we're thinking about not just the content of what's being said, but also how it's being assessed by these models. Okay, just um, quickly talking about some possibilities on a more optimistic note. Um, so uh, some of this is a little bit more um, uh, uh, more like recent um, research, but so there um, is this nice paper um, that um, brings social choice theory in um, integrated into LLMs. Um, so this paper on generative social choice um, will survey um, a lot of participants and then try to take, you know, a thousand different um, uh, qualitative responses um, from people, just written responses, um, and then summarize that in a series of different passages and says, okay, like, do you agree or not? Like that, this summary statement represents how you feel. And the paper shows that a lot of you know, the vast majority of the candidates um, will say that, you know, the statement really does like mostly or perfectly represent um, how I feel. So this could be a really good opportunity um, as ways of doing information elicitation in participatory processes um, that I know um, US uh, GCRP uh, puts forth for these assessments. And I just- Wait, can you finish up soon, please? Yes, um, and I just wanted to flag um, OpenAI um, has um, a number of other projects that they've supported um, that's bringing democratic inputs in. Um, and I'm gonna um, skip over uh, this uh, this bit about um, other forms um, of, of AI outside of LLMs, um, but here's just a summary slide um, about 
um, what I see as some of the pitfalls and possibilities. Thank you. Great, thanks. Uh, our third speaker in this session is Ann Bostrom, uh, who's a professor in environmental policy at the Evans School of Public Policy at University of Washington. She studies risk perceptions, risk communication, and mental models of hazards, and co-leads the risk communication uh, in the NSF AI Institute for Research on Trustworthy AI in Weather, Climate, and Coastal Oceanography. And welcome, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Great, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes. I can't see you. So great, great. Okay. So just to tell you where slide. I'm coming from is, can you see it? Yes, we see your slide. Okay, great. Okay. Um, so I am, as Stephen said, I co-lead risk communication research in AI2ES, which is the NSF AI Institute for Research on Trustworthy AI in Weather, Climate, and Coastal Oceanography with an emphasis on the trust part. And uh, to tell, let you know where we're coming from, I co-lead with Julie DeMuth, who has training in atmospheric science and risk communication, and she focuses on hazardous weather communications, risk perceptions, and responses among both experts, forecasters in particular, and, pu and various publics. My training is in risk and decision analysis and behaviors, with a research focus on mental models of hazardous processes and how risk and on risk per perception and communication, asking such questions as how do people understand climate change, how, and do, uh, how do and can different approaches to communicating about climate change and its risks affect and inform decisions about climate change and what drives trust in and trustworthiness judgments of AI and ML for weather and climate to let you know sort of the context for our research. And I'm going to focus much more on research processes here that might be relevant for USGCRP. So in our work, we view AI and AI outputs as a form of risk communication. It's a form of risk information for expert and professional users. For example, the kinds of people who work for USGCRP or are involved in these national assessments who can use it to manage risks from weather, climate, and coastal hazards in our work, whether they'll occur, when, and how severe, et cetera. And we also focus on trust and trustworthiness, which are both social cons constructs and our particular focal interest, as we've heard um, I'm sure you've heard many times today, and I just heard from Marsha McNutt a few minutes ago in a different talk, um, in the context of developing and refining AI model guidance in particular. And we draw on, as you can see to the in the figure to the right here, a variety of uh, theoretical and empirical social science literature. And we apply diverse social science methods to investigate fundamental uh, risk communication research questions and goals. And um, uh, some of these techniques draw from early judgment decision-making research. So it's, it is really quite diverse. So to summarize how we think about this, we see AI predictions functioning as a type of risk information. So in one of um, our recent studies, we looked at two new prototypes, one that use CNA, CNN probabilities of hell, hail, and um, I'm sorry, this is obscuring my... Um, let me hide this. Um, storm mode and uh, random forest probabilities of severe hail. And these are used by professional decision makers, uh, including the National Weather Service, emergency managers, and Department of Transportation decision makers, for example, to uh, make decisions to assess in terms of how they assess the risks of weather hazards and make critical job specific decisions. So in our work, in our work there, we've been using Think Aloud protocols with an interactive device that's modeled on the early mouse lab studies, I don't know if any of you are familiar with those, but we also use surveys and interview techniques. And we ask questions like how do different attributes, for example, the technique use, the training of the model, the model input variables and model performance influence forecasters' perceptions of model trustworthiness. And in our work to date, we have uh, have findings at three scales. So first at the prototype scale, we find that developers hand lab labeling inputs to develop predictions of storm mode increased forecasters' trustworthiness judgments of the, the guidance if the developers had relevant domain expertise. So in this context, the resource intensive task of human hand labeling may be really important for some purposes. Second, across prototypes and attributes of uh, the guidance, we found that forecasters' trustworthiness judgments were a function of the information about the AI model technique, especially input variables, and this echoes some things that you've heard from the previous two speakers, and information about model performance, especially failure modes, which goes back to our first speaker here, Katie, and, and the importance uh, here also uh, of, it's also a function of the importance of being able to interact with the AI model output. They wanted to be able to do some sensitivity analysis themselves and see if they could get different results. So overall, forecasters 
trust in new AI guidance we see as a progressive process. It's not instantaneous and not maximized at the outset. And the snapshot here on the left shows that even in the course of our short study, about an hour and a half with the forecasters, we found that their trustworthiness judgments uh, assessments changed quite a bit. So if we take this uh, a par parallel, think about hypothetically about how this could apply for the US GCRP decision makers, we can think of AI outputs functioning as a type of risk communication. So we have existing and emerging prototype AI models that might be used in the context of these assessments, and that these would be used by US GCRP authors and others in the national um, a uh, nature assessment as well as a national climate assessment to assess risks of climate change, but also of climate change research review, assessment, and synthesis processes, and to make critical decisions, for example, about compliance with the Information Quality Act. And so in thinking about the parallels of the processes that could be considered, it might be important to collaborate with the USAI Safety Institute and the Institute and others to conduct research with US GCRP authors to ask questions such as how do different attributes, for example, the AI technique use, the training of the AI model, and the AI model input variables and model performance influence reviewers and writers' perceptions of model trustworthiness. And this goes back to the RMF playbooks that Katie mentioned. We were conducting a couple of other kinds of research too, and among other things, we are in the middle, um, well, nearing hopefully completion of this fall, a systematic review of what Glicks and Woolley have called embedded AI, which is AI that doesn't have a physical manifestation in the form of robotics, for example. And uh, from that work, we're seeing among other things that trustworthiness worthiness stems from intersecting factors. This is aligns with the research that we've been conducting ourselves as well. And this includes users' decision-making needs and specific contexts, the data quality and representativeness, model development processes, techniques, and specifics, the, the model availability, interpretability, explainability, and integration into users' workflows. So we have to think about these review and assessment processes and perceptions of the model developer's expertise. Finally, model skill or performance and in the context of weather forecasting, this is across hazards and geography, but it's always, it depends, it's domain specific. So in medicine, you find different contextual factors that matter. But I highlight model scale, like scale here because I want to emphasize that generic measures of performance like a root mean squared error may be totally inappropriate and uninformative for specific applications. So we'd have to think about what performance metrics of model accuracy and skill are relevant for the US GCRP context. We also see that trust is inherently emotional and subjective, and this complicates efforts to calibrate uh, trustworthiness and decide, for example, if, if trust is warranted. To develop trustworthy AI ML, we conclude from across the studies we've conducted and seen that it's important to improve measurement of trust in AI as a dynamic contingent process, and that will be the case for USGCRP2, to learn which contingencies and contextual factors, factors matter through co-design and co-protection. So this goes directly to the, to the participatory processes that I think Lily just highlighted, and engage across the entire AI lifecycle from development of models all the way through to application maintenance and revision and to develop and test strategies for communicating the uncertainties of AI ML model output, which is no simple feat. I'm just going to close with two points on considerations for what you are undertaking or advising USGCRP on undertaking, and that is to consider assessing how AI is used in USGCRP work, but also as well as how it's used in its inputs um, and the inputs to its work. And finally, that the rapid evolution of AI is absolutely critical in this context. There's a strong need for agile approaches to assessment when you may not have the same model from one month to the next. Now we'll stop there so we have time for discussion. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Anne, Katie, and Lily. Uh, the floor is open for questions. I will be monitoring the um, the panes for hands up. Um, thanks, everyone. That was a really engaging um, um, panel. My question is for Lily, um, especially about this concept of, you know, a data deficiency and what happens when there's a data deficiency. So AI will have limits in its use in, in a literature review um, because of that, but it also doesn't prohibit regular use 
of literature <laughs> that might come from different places or is not accessible in those ways that, that an AI model might be able to draw from. I guess my question is, is just because an AI model shows something as deficient doesn't necessarily mean that the data is deficient. It might just be in other places from other sources and other forms. So what are ways that we could bridge the gap between AI deficiencies and other forms of knowing that could be more robust in how we actually assess the literature on a whole? Yeah, so I think this this question of um, uncertainty quantification and understanding concretely what are we uncertain about? Is it missing data? Is it like missing um, precision? In statistics, there's this term between like aleatoric versus epistemic uncertainty, one of which you can like know and reduce the other one just like inherent about, you know, there's uncertainty about whether it's not, not it's going to rain today. And it's we can't precisely know that no matter what. Um, but at the same time, like, I think I uh, one constant bias that AI has um, in its unknowing is that it requires things to be like mostly tabular. It requires things to be like very concrete laid out. It requires things to be consistent. And this doesn't really give rise to other forms of knowledge. And one concrete example um, of this um, in the context of climate um, and nature is that um, a lot of data um, that is being used um, for biodiversity monitoring is geospatial data and assuming there are things that we can represent on a map in a GIS shape file. Um, but then there's other um, forms of data um, where, such as indigenous knowledge, um, where you know they don't see things in a bird's eye view and rather they're like more so in, you know, they really have kind of like local context or intuiting things on the ground. Um, that is a very different form of knowledge that is much more difficult to like instill into an AI system, but somebody with that local context can, you know, help uh, capture it and do that translation of, okay, how do we put this in a form that's, you know, more easily synthesizable um, in the, the broader picture. But um, I, I think recognizing that the data deficiencies um, that um, AI has some of it is in the data, but also it just it's just ignorant to an entire category of knowledge. Could I, Stephen? Could I add something to that? As a, um, Absolutely. Yeah, I just want to say that this is a, a clear example of where you really want human AI teaming. So humans in the loop in the context and and to think about not only that teaming in the context of of supplementing specific data deficiencies or biases, as Lily suggested, but also in the context of developing models that um, have a better approach to trying to figure out how to incorporate different kinds of knowledge. Thanks. I see we now have two hands up. Uh, we'll take those two hands and then we'll close out this discussion uh, and hand it over to Sarah. Julie V. Hey, um, no, the, the great information. I, I want to circle back. One of the earlier panels, we were talking a lot about training and guidance when it comes to kind of entering into this field. And where would you point to or recommend as, as the field emerges? Like, where are sources that people can understand how this is all evolving? Well, I'll just jump in and say the National Academies has a lot of resources. The human AI teaming report is a great place, but it's, I mean, it's dated already, right? So, uh, and frankly, I've done a, a little bit of work trying to keep up with what's going on, even on the regulatory scene. It's extremely difficult. <laughs> I, would, I would say- uh, give Futurepedia.io a shout out for it. That's a, just a huge compendium of AI tools. Um, if you want to know what's the latest, <clears throat> what, what were you going to say? Oh, I was going to say, in terms of tracking okay. um, uh, potential harms and um, biases, there are some really good resources from um, a number of nonprofits, and I will find I can find them and put them in. But who have really spent time, you know, documenting the harms, and I would say that's those are useful to know about when you start to think about mitigation strategies, right? And to think about where you put humans in the loop and things like that. And so just being really familiar with the harms and then as they change, um, so that you can identify them and mitigate yeah. them um, if possible. And the other thing to keep in mind is all the latest papers, at least in machine learning, and I think in most forms of AI, are published on archive. So if you want to keep up, you have to look at archive. 
I'll also quickly add just in the context of like translating AI to um, other things outside of Silicon Valley or staying in academia, uh, I find that uh, one of the fields that is kind of like most at the frontier tends to be medicine, just because it's a very big world. And they also face a lot of the same challenges as us, you know, they face, you know, bias is really important to them. Um, so the interpretability is really important to them. Um, so they I find that kind of they're often like the first mover um, compared to other fields. So it might be a, a good translational reference. Thanks, all three. Uh, Miriam, last question. Yeah, thank you so much for for your presentations. They're super interesting. And it just it's making me think whether or I mean, how do you think about uh, AI seems to be reproducing inequalities that are already existing in society if you do not have the checks and balances. And, uh, you know, I, I know we're talking about we need AI experts, 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 but it also seems very key to have, I don't want to say equity experts, I don't know what's, what the word is, but it seems that if you just use AI without any critical lens or concept of inequalities, in, intrinsic or structural inequalities in society, you're just going to replicate what already is wrong with society. So how, how do we work around uh, this, right? It's, it's a tool, and I was more hopeful uh, about this tool, but it seems to be doing the same things that um, tools do. Sorry, well, let me just jump in and say that there is a lot of work going on in this domain, and and Katie mentioned repair, for example. I think it was Katie, um, and and um, I know uh, well. Amy McGovern and I have just got a new grant. That we're looking at working with NIST and others on identifying bias within the earth sciences um, applications of AI and thinking about ways of mitigating biases. So we have a a paper on sort of how you can think about where biases creep in, and the there are structural institutional biases, there are human judgment and decision-making biases, there are also data biases and modeling biases. And the human judgment decision-making biases interact with all of these and are strongly influenced by structural and institutional biases. So we hope that with this general framework, um, which is a, 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 an a, adapted from and evolved from NIST's framework, that we'll be able to make some headway on giving people guidance on how to more more systematically mitigate biases in, in thinking about biases. But that's very domain-specific for us, and it, it probably is necessary to have domain-specific approaches across different, um, across AI. So. Yeah, this form of Socio-technical knowledge, and this is that's a word that NIST is using a lot now in risk mitigation um, around AI, is has been hard to access in the past, right? It hasn't been taught alongside AI development um, up until sort of now. And, and it's, so, you know, to some degree, this problem is going to get better in that there are now lots of programs doing, you know, social data science or socio-technical this, and that, which is great. Um, but, you know, we still, we are lacking in this expertise generally, I think. Um, but yes, exactly like Anne said, there are, you know, sort of pockets of it in various places. And uh, I'm universities are paying a lot of attention to this. So you know, give us five years, but it doesn't solve your problem now, right? It's sort of needing this knowledge about, about social relationships and power and that go alongside data. Um, well, thank you, uh, Katie, Anne, and especially Lily for uh, working after hours uh, here with us. Uh, thank you all for your thoughts. And uh, well, oh, Stephen had something. Yeah, I just wanted to pick on, pick up on uh, something that a number of people just noted, which is NIST. And NIST is doing great work. And there's some information in your meeting materials. Uh, we were hoping, and they were hoping to be here, but we were actually directly overlapping with the NIST uh, AI um, workshop yesterday and today. And so their absence uh, it does not say anything. It's actually, I encourage everybody to follow what NIST is doing um, and uh, we will find other times to connect with them. All right. Um, so it's it's great to kind of follow up this discussion that we've been having about um, AI and the sort of risk and the considerations of bias and the values that have been presented by the speakers and to now sort of think a little bit more about the, the stages um, of the NCA 
and um, the existing information quality principles that are all are already used. Um, so we can kind of think about how do these principles um, that are already used for the NCA relate to the considerations that we have as people who use or produce the NCA. Um, and so I am going to share an activity with you all where we're the goal is for us to all reflect a little bit on our considerations throughout the different stages and um, to try to um, give some of those user experience examples into a table so that we can um, then um, share, uh, have a discussion about what the underlying principles are that we're seeing and the considerations that we have. And everybody will have different sort of um, experiences or depths um, of experience with different parts of the um, stages, um, depending on what you're doing. And I, I, I think I have some slides too that I can, we can walk through here. <laughs> so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the example um, that, that uh, I have. Um, do you have, I think there's some slides. <laughs> Oh yeah, there. So um, an example, um, I'm just going to talk about my experience as a user of the NCA. And um, I have, um, uh, Carlton has helped form the Northfield Climate Action Plan and, um, and significantly helped with the city's decarbonization efforts and um, before I arrived. And now in my current role, there's a, there's sort of, I've learned that the resilience and justice goals have been harder to meet. Um, and yet there's keen interest in the college in supporting that. So one of the things that we've decided to do is to start engaging the flooding that regularly occurs on the river. And a way to have conversations is to have community science projects on the river that engage in sampling so students can have conversations about water quality and climate change impacts and discussions of what a better future might be. And so we work together with community members and city decision makers and the College of St. Olaf across the river um, to sort of identify some common goals and interest around there. So we've launched this project. I can have you flip the slide. And I just wanted to talk through like my students. Um, I think sustainability offices often have students look at you know energy data and um, they they make help make interventions that reduce those emissions. So I I think in, when you're moving into climate change and resilience, um, you similarly only have these students for a little while, um, but you need them to know some really big key things about what climate change looks like. So when I think about um, my um, what I want my students to know. I use the NCA to help them um, sort of understand the big picture context. Um, the scene setting um, literature review part for me is I want them to understand what the major climate impacts are in the Midwest and to have that understanding before they're engaging any stakeholders so they can put their problem in the context of the other issues that might come up. Um, and also, um, we're working really hard to coordinate and deepen our relationships with the indigenous communities around us. So it's important for me that my students know how to use the NCA to find out that that information that they're looking at also incorporates um, indigenous knowledge. So that's sort of when I think about the, um, you know, this is my user experience. Um, when I think about uh, students, uh, looking at the writing and figure generation and review stages. So um, one of the things that's important for me is many of my students have limited experience with climate change um, in their classes. And I want them to understand where to go to consensus information, to find rigorous information to just sort of understand what they're seeing. And so I want them to be able to uh, see evidence um, that information that they're looking at represents consensus. Um, and then the other sort of things I think about is, you know, my students are also like pretty new at science and trying to figure out, you know, what is a good figure, what information is worth presenting. And I find that it's super helpful to have, use the NCA as a resource for them to see what a high quality figure is, to be able to understand the information that it presents and to look at and discuss those figures before they go on and generate additional figures. Um, so then sort of thinking about, um, I know that NCA itself has a lot of dissemination products um, that are sort of derivative, um, but my students also make derivative products where they 
they um, are thinking about um, what uh, information that they want to present in the context of this climate change that they've learned about. So they will be trying to share information on the water quality data that they find in the context of how that will change with climate change and making those connections is really important. So um, I want them to, to be able to think about all of these things along the process. And so then the sort of, you see the second column down is uh, where the, the priority principles um, are sort of mapped. I looked through the examples that I gave you for each stage of the things that I think about with my students and thought about what are the underpinning principles that I'm really trying to get my students to, con to consider. And you can see sort of parallels and if you're on the development side, there's just different sets of things that you think about. So um, for the example of the big picture, the comprehensiveness matters and understanding that there are multiple climate impacts. Um, for the understanding that consensus piece, um, I want uh, students to know uh, the soundness of the information and know that the assumptions are clear when they look at things and be able to evaluate that. Um, and then when they're looking at figures, I need those figures need to be clear. Um, we wanna have discussions on why they're clear. We wanna have discussions on access. Um, I, tell stories about how um, I've shown figures that are too complicated. I used to do work a lot on redlining in Springfield, Ohio, <laughs> and uh, map both uh, the redlining map and other variables over it. And oftentimes that would be confusing. Uh, so I think it's, it's good to sort of have these discussions about what makes figures clear, to kind of look at these strong examples and to think about um, what the principles are that you're trying um, to get to have happen throughout this process. And then those principles can then be related to the sort of tools um, and ideas um, for AI and, support, and the assessment needs um, that we have associated with AI. So this activity, I'll have you flip to the next slide. Oh, there's some bonus. Yeah, I didn't realize there were that people. <laughs> One more. I keep going, yeah. Yeah, so um, what we'll be doing is everybody's going to be thinking about just, it's really useful for us to go through cases of either developing parts of the NCA or um, to think about your user experience related to that category um, in a breakout room. And um, you'll you'll first go into that room and reflect on, you know, some sort of engage or e engagement either as a user or a developer. Um, and then um, it, for the stages that you're thinking about, think about what your concerns are as you're engaging that stage um, and what's important to you and sort of list out what the concern is, give a concrete example, and then um, we'll be uh, discussing what the principles are that we need to advance um, to pr uh, produce and apply an authoritative, accessible and usable NCA. Um, and it's important, I think this is like the most important thing at task I can say is that when we go into these breakout rooms, uh, make sure you have a moderator and a reporter. So the moderator's job is to sort of um, be inclusive and support an inclusive process so that um, folks in the room um, share perspectives into the table. Each breakout room will have a table um, and the reporter will um, uh, the reporter will make sure that the things get into the table so we have things to share and to dis discuss. Um, each group will be assigned one um, part of the NCA process to focus on. Um, and uh, to that end, if you get stuck, you can sort of explore some other categories, but we'd like you to try to fill, we're trying to fill in all of these with different types of examples. Um, I think, you know, it took me a little bit to think through my own experience with an example. Take a little time in the room to think a little bit for yourself before you start um, discussing and adding to the matrix. Um, and then, um, you know, after you've sort of had that discussion and filled in the matrix a little bit, um, think about um, key principles that you want to report out. We don't need the, in your report out, you won't be walking through the case like I did you'll be walking through the underpinning principles. And really we're hoping to just have that discussion where there's some underpinning thing or some things that were coming out um, that you saw as underpinning a lot of these. And we're not seeing this as a comprehensive activity, but really an illustration, you know, an illustration of um, different ways that we're all in engaging in the types of principles that could be considered throughout the process. So just to 
what we're trying to do um, in this session is connect two parts of what we've talked about mm -hmm. this morning, what Dave was talking about, looking at the stages of the NCA mm -hmm. process, and then what are the principles? And mm -hmm. we're really asking you to step in from your own engagement, however you've been engaged and however you use connect to the National Climate Assessment and say, for my uses or for my participation as an author, these are the things that I find central um, to the NCA. Um, so even though this is a meeting about AI, we're sort of asking you for this, this next session to set the AI piece apart. <laughs> Because what we were just hearing about in that in this last session about principles is unless you really know what your outcomes are that you're trying to get to, it's hard to make those decisions about whether a tool mm -hmm. is applicable or not. And we're fortunate in that we're not starting from scratch. <laughs> NCA has done a really good job and documented in the reports some of the key principles that they that they see as central to making it an authoritative document. But here we're really asking you to come from your own perspective and think through what are those principles that if you're making some of these decisions, what would uphold, what would be requirements of tools, whether they're AI or other procedural tools that advance and support those principles as then we take the next step tomorrow to think about how do we think about AI now and going forward in ways that is protecting and advancing and enabling um, those principles that that we all um, see as central to enabling the kind of document that we know that we need to have to support the federal uses, the the community uses, mm -hmm. and everything in between of of a authoritative national climate assessment. Um, so we're going to send you out into into groups. We're going to do. We're not. We've been done a, high, a completely hybrid meeting to this point. At this point, though, we're going to break out and only have virtual breakout groups <laughs> or in-person breakout groups. We're not going to try to span the two. So we'll um, be breaking this group into three in here in the room into three uh, groups. Two will stay in here and one will go into room 104. Mm -hmm. And then um, we will also be um, working the um, breaking the virtual folks out into separate breakouts. Um, we are not staffing all of these, so we do ask you to to have um, have uh, people who will be moderators and and um, and reporters for these sessions. And we will also pop in um, after um, about forty minutes to let people know that um, we're going to be reconvening. Um, so any questions about what we're doing next? Mike. Uh, yeah, Mike. Stephen, I just want to make a comment. Um, I, I want to make it clear we did not set, pay Sarah to say those things about the National Climate Assessment. Um, but I'm telling you, there are a bunch of people that, you know, our hearts are just swelling up hearing you say, we use this to teach students, and we see this as an example of how a good figure is put together. It just, you know, it does this for us, Sarah. Thank, thank you. We really appreciate it. And the feedback is is um, rewarding. Thanks. Anytime. So use this as a time to ground ground yourself back in. Why are we doing this work of the assessments? Um, and then we will use that as an important um, input to our conversation going forward tomorrow. Um, we're gonna. We're just about there. Bye. <laughs> okay. Um, so let's let's do this here in this room. Let's count off by three, and we've got, we've got the virtual people set up. But here in the room, Julie, if you'll start, um, just count off by three, and we'll we'll go into the one, two, and three groups. Sarah. Sarah. One. Sarah. Sarah.
um, I put a I put a um, link into the chat. Um, if folks will open where it says um, materials for the breakout session, um, and um, so the virtual there are six groups set up there. I'll, I will set up a seventh because we will need a seventh in that in that chat. Um, let me open this document um, and share it. Um, Okay. Um, sorry. Get back to my Zoom here. And share. All right. So we'll go. We'll go through these, and I'm just gonna give some examples um, from our group, um, and then I'll gather other groups as more people sit. Um, <laughs> uh, in our group. The, just say one thing. I just want to note that um, for whoever is reporting out, if you could make sure that that slide captures oh, yeah. your key things, because we're going to spend some time tonight and pull together thoughts from all of the groups as inputs for tomorrow. So if you can make sure those slides have those key things that you want us to know. And we reserve the right to choose representative examples. <laughs> um, but yes, well, thank you to you all for um, going and doing this activity. Um, I am just going to share from our group, group six. We'll go in reverse order perhaps here. So group six, that slide, um, our, the, the, the principles that we came up with were trust, integrity, understandable, connective and contextual, approachability and human, precise, um, accessibility, uh, navig navigability. So those are the things that we came up with. And I think we spent, um, one of the reflections I have from that is we spent some time sort of thinking about the high level information quality and then moved towards conversations that were more around context and contextual and art and the value of um, human connections more. So that's probably the biggest takeaway. How about group five? Um, and when we're sharing these out too, if you've heard things before, um, feel free to not say them again. Um, but we'll, we'll just get some more examples. So group five. I was the reporter for group five. Uh, we focused on the first column, scene setting and literature review. We noted the importance for scene setting of considering what has already been covered in assessments, what is pretty settled knowledge and not spending time or, or ink on those things and really focusing on what's new, what's important, what's changed. Um, and th that can maybe be a little more difficult to assess because, um, you know, we sort of carry a textbook knowledge and we're exposed to some of the new things, but, but there's sort of a time lag. And so, you know, being alert to where there's new information, this is one way that AI may be able to help is bringing to our attention things that we may have missed um, because we're, we're, our, we're sort of building on our personal existing knowledge base. Um, we also talked about, the, you know, using that as an opportunity to organize the report, and we talked about how the chapter structures have changed from one NCA to the next or one IPCC to the next. That's already sort of settled for NCA 6, so we didn't spend much time on that. Um, one of our priority considerations was making the report actionable, so even starting at the very beginning, you know, when you're assessing literature, and but thinking about, you know, we want to pay attention to things that downstream users are going to care about and you know particularly flagging emerging issues uh, that that m m maybe those folks who are mainly getting their education about climate science through assessment reports uh, need to know about for planning or, or uh, uh, that sort of purpose um, and that's true also for us academics sometimes we we use the assessment reports to teach us what is important uh, but that lends further importance to the role of the assessor. And so this this sort of led into our priority principles. Um, so the, the our number one priority principle is use AI intelligently. Um, but unpacking that word intelligently, I mean, that's the whole point of this two-day meeting. What it What is intelligent use of AI? Um, it's not just about um, ethics and balance and and you know looking for bias and that sort of thing. But also, how can we use AI to prompt us to pay attention to things we may not have, 
um, to help us identify knowledge gaps. That's even harder because it pays attention, as we heard from Lily, it pays attention to the data that trained it. And so uh, it can be really hard to, you know, unless you're operating with an actual geographic map where it can be plain as day that there's some area that doesn't have data, um, it can be really hard to understand where, where our knowledge gaps really are. Um, so that's where a sort of intelligent human um, comes in and sort of um, seeing beyond what's there to what's not there. Um, and then uh, finally, accessibility and public availability of AI tools. So are, are we, is the assessment relying on um, tools that may be obscure or hidden from the average user who couldn't then sort of replicate the assessment if they wanted to? Um, and they, are, they aren't always friendly, sometimes uh, antagonistic uh, parties will use, uh, you know, will look for, as, as Dave noted, mismatches across chapters or inconsistencies or, or, you know, use AI to flag papers that may not have been considered in the assessment report. Um, group five, did I miss any key points? Okay, thanks. All right, and we'll have group four go. And one quick thing, too, if you did not talk about AI, our discussion tomorrow, we'll have more time for that, too, if you were just thinking about the just general use now of information quality now. Um, so group four. Microphone. Sorry. Sorry. Yes, thank you. <laughs> uh, we started out by focusing on the dissemination and follow on activities and priority and our principles associated with that. And uh, our first um, comment or thoughts were around interactivity and accessibility um, in the report. Um, we then spent time talking about the very important, the NCA3 videos and how valuable those were for um, helping localize place-based visual relational um, uh, communication that helps people see their place and their, their, their importance in the, in the reporting um, and in the what's happening. Uh, and then we moved to thinking about multiple audiences and different kinds of information and data that are needed. Um, and, uh, and I'm going to let others fill in. And, and uh, we had some good ideas about the possibilities of how to convey complexities and compounding complexities associated with climate and structural inequality and justice. Um, and we had a really good idea for thinking about the development of a user guide, a more interactive user guide um, to help people navigate NCA. Um, any other? Fill in with details, my group, because I that's a big broad brush. A uh, microphone. I think like a, that was awesome. Thank you. <laughs> um, I think another you know connected overarching point was you know, with thinking about those, the follow-on activities and kind of products and outreach and engagement is what can be, what's provided to folks to kind of, you know, humanize the process and create those connections and facilitate that relationship between them, where they are, their place, their situations, which goes back to a lot of those interrelated issues that climate is, you know, one layer on top of what they're already experiencing in many ways. Um, and so how to think about, um, you know, it came up to the multitude of audiences being communicated to, um, you know, with a big one, um, it came up a few times with kind of educators, teachers, how they're using the information. And so in the context to the idea of the user guide coming up of how to share the information in a way that's digestible and translatable to those then who are actually the ones maybe accessing <laughs> the chapters and the report um, to help do some of that legwork for, to make it usable to then the audiences that they work with as kind of those translators and liaisons. Um, and then really thinking about how people, um, especially when you're coming from a more overburdened communities of how you're able to take the information and also see the hope in action. And so that is not just handing down, okay, here's you know the doom and gloom, 
but really incorporating, um, which goes back to those interrelated factors of what people initiatives are doing about it um, and considering kind of the different scenarios that people are preparing for. But others fill in. Great. How about the online group three? And uh, feel free to focus on the sort of principles that you're uncovering too, because we've heard a lot of examples. If you've heard re repeats, um, if you can add some new examples, if you have them, but uh, you, principles are also okay. We merged some groups. So Miriam, do you want, okay. Miriam, your group, um, if you can go. Yeah, I think Michael, Michael, you were going to be the reporter. Is that okay? Yeah, sure. Um, so when we were talking about, I guess we initially talked about some concerns. Um, you know, who one of the one of the themes that came out of our conversation was, you know, who gets to say what knowledge goes into the report and understanding, you know, the underlying structure of that knowledge. You know, I think kind of a concrete example that came out of that is, you know, much of much of our scientific knowledge or what we consider scientific knowledge comes from the global north. Um, and, you know, there needs to be a focus on recognizing the internal bias uh, that comes into that knowledge generation and that knowledge selection. Um, and I think uh, gathering the best possible scientific knowledge would center the barriers of accessing that information, you know, from the start. Oh, co-host has has to start my video. Sure. Um, and <clears throat> you know, and then another another thing, another concern we talked about, which I think was just touched on a few minutes ago, but um, usability, or I think maybe somebody else called it actionability. Um, you know, this is always always a challenge. I'm sure um, with such a broad report. You know, when actionability and usability comes down to, you know, increased specificity, but, you know, the more specific you get, that kind of narrows the scope of how wide you can get. So we talked about that trade off um, a little bit as well. Um, and I think, you know, those are kind of two of the two of the main things that we talked about that haven't been touched on um, by previous presenters. Great, and then we have Ju Julie. If it's your groups, <laughs> right? I think Aaron was gonna report out for us. Hi all. Um, so yeah, we're we're Group One. Um, we covered just like Group Five. We covered the very beginnings of writing the report, so scene setting and literature review. Um, we also talked about chapter topics, so trying to figure out what topics should be covered. And then also making sure that we're not glossing over topics that really need to be reiterated for a new audience. Um, so we thought the priority principle under that was usefulness, uh, just being a useful report. Another really important aspect that we touched on, I don't think other teams have touched on, is making sure they're diverse and new perspectives by finding new authors um, while also maintaining institutional knowledge. And that really goes back to inclusivity and making sure that we have uh, diversity in very many metrics and also making sure there's a mix of of new um, authors and also folks who have been on the report before. And all of these relate to considerations both with AI and AI usage, but then also just considerations in building the report in general. And then another one that we talked about, which wasn't really covered too much, is the chapter meetings themselves and the chapter teams and their deliberations. Um, they're coming to consensus, the consensus process, having sensitive conversations amongst each other. Um, and that really gets back not only to the tr trustworthiness of the report, but having trustworthy and trusting collaborations. So making sure that these teams work cohesively, that they trust each other, they respect each other, that they're following our code of conduct. And um, there are AI considerations, which are kind of sometimes unanticipated when you do things like um, transcribe using a meeting transcription service to transcribe the entire content of that meeting, which is then turned um, de facto into a public record. So uh, a few things that we covered on our in our group. Uh, happy to have someone else jump in if I missed anything. 
Yeah, thank you for these thoughts. And I just wanted to kind of mention that we're sort of towards the end of our time here, but we, uh, does anybody have any final thoughts on this after hearing these? We have time for one, one or two more thoughts. I think that that last point there, you sort of, um, Aaron, I think that was a, a, a really great point and you brought the sort of negative of that, having something become public record. But I think the positive side, I came to the, what was it called this summer, the climate crossroads. And um, there was discussion about how, um, you know, during Zoom, during COVID, everything happened on Zoom and there was this uh, breakdown in trust um, between author groups and in the scientific process and this sort of unanticipated loss in, in cohesion. And I think there's a similar type of risk with over-reliance on AI in the early stage of, you know, building that trust and consensus. And so I just um, wanted to, when Aaron brought that up, it like brought back hearing that discussion of the sort of unintended consequences and how there's been this effort to sort of rebalance the amount of hybrid and in-person opportunities um, to sort of rebuild that trust in the scientific community. Thanks, and, and we're gonna continue on track on this discussion a little bit more tomorrow, um, thinking about, oh, sorry, is there one more? One more hand. One more hand. Oh, Kathy, sorry, Kathy. Yeah, sorry, I had to I had to go teach, so I'm afraid I missed all the group discussion, but one thing um, coming from um, Montana and having done a state climate assessment is that it's really challenging to have those the national information and then the international information get down to a more local level that actually people um, can relate to and are concerned about. And so I've always been a little frustrated that there isn't more linkage made to some of the state climate assessment efforts in the documents. Um, in a way that would give people a roadmap as to how to go from the, the, the higher up scales down to local scales. So I, I, somebody's probably already said that, I apologize, but I just wanted to say it. We have a break for 10 minutes. Yes. Okay. We're adjourned. Okay. For this next session, um, we are uh, turning to some pr practical uh, applications of, uh, or, or co practical cons considerations of how AI guidance has emerged um, uh, from the publishing realm. Um, so we have Allison Appling, Laura Kmeck, and Tony Broccoli. Um, Allison uh, is a geochemist who looks at mo modeling advances that bring together scientific knowledge and data-driven models. She's based in State College, Pennsylvania. Um, so for this session, I believe we have 50 minutes total so let's let's say 15 minutes per speaker and hopefully if you're all on time that'll give us five minutes at the end for q a allison thanks just had to find my audio yeah thank you so much for the opportunity to to join you today i've been learning a lot and really appreciating the discussion so far and i also want to start by thanking my team members on this usgs effort we've been developing an artificial intelligence strategy for the whole US Geological Survey, um, inclusive of our publishing practices and, and more. So our team convened last fall and has been working since then with these objectives of designing USGS specific goals that are consistent with our umbrella Department of Interior's AI strategy, which actually was released just yesterday. So here's the link to that. Um, and we've been looking in our work to recommend methods to increase adoption of AI across the USGS to support our current and future science needs in the Bureau, and also to provide appropriate sideboards, policy and guidelines and so on that are consistent with the national policies that now guide all, all of our work. 
So in thinking about developing this strategy, we began by surveying some of the use case categories of how AI is being used and how it can be used at the US Geological Survey. Uh, we broke this into these categories of research and operations and business and work productivity with the idea that each of these categories could have very different risks, very different needs technically, and also very different opportunities for governance. Um, so we broke them out this way, and I can share a bit of what we uh, put together here. So for research AI use cases, this was about using AI to analyze Earth observation data. I know this one is broadly out of scope for today, um, but it includes things at USGS like national land cover mapping with AI, developing new hypotheses about drivers of things like aquatic vegetation prevalence, and also this fifth bullet of uh, generating future projections of water quality under conditions of changing climate or changing land use. Um, and so I can imagine that assessments may want to bring some uh, artificial intelligence understanding to the evaluation of outputs of this sort as, as you're going through the literature and bringing that together into your assessments. Some of the common risks in this kind of application are uh, biases in data, biases in model performance, as has brought up, been brought up multiple times today, um, and risks, therefore, to uh, environmental management decisions that get made based on that information or stakeholder trust in our data. Um, but there are also these potential benefits of maybe improved natural resource understanding uh, through predictions and hypothesis generation and all that. Operational AI use cases are about these real-time production of model outputs that get uh, shared directly with the public right then. Um, and so for USGS, that might mean uh, putting an AI model into the quality control loop uh, as we're uh, collecting new data and serving it to the public. But for assessments, that might include some of the information dissemination that you've talked about for helping people navigate the assessments. Uh, and some of the risks here uh, involve little to no opportunity for USGS staff to intervene before the public sees the model outputs. Uh, but then the, the benefit there is that we can probably answer more user questions more quickly, more accurately, uh, and reach a greater audience. And lastly, business and work productivity use cases really is maybe where the meat of uh, the assessment AI uses could come in, uh, because this includes uses of large language models for things like drafting code or social media posts or report text. Um, and we've really enjoyed this uh, business-oriented working paper uh, from Delacqua et al. that shows really, really cleanly that for um, this, this dummy task they had where they asked study participants to develop new product ideas for new beverages or new footwear. Uh, people who engaged with a generative AI system, shown in these bars in blue, um, actually had not just more efficient, but better answers on this creative idea generation task and refining those ideas. Um, and so it, we know now from experience that generative AI can help us in these ways. Uh, you can also use it to summarize and analyze publications as was presented really wonderfully this morning and other information products. Uh, and maybe help use generative AI to uh, support us in efficiency in our everyday tasks, whether that's developing metadata or developing progress reports or supporting uh, projects with documentation. Um, and the risks with generative AI, as, as we've brought up, have been uh, this potential for insufficient human review. We know that generative AI can make mistakes. Um, and I really like how this Del Aqua paper also introduced this idea of a jagged frontier of AI capabilities where uh, this dashed line represents how hard we think a, ta a task is, and these two tasks are equally hard, but the AI finds that one of these tasks is much easier than the other. Um, some things are within the frontier, some things are not, and we don't know a priori which ones those are gonna be. So there's a lot to learn about how to use these well, right? Uh, and really a need for ongoing human review in, in, in the process. Uh, at USGS, we also noted this reliance on external expertise and services. We're, we're looking to some other agency or company to supply a large language model. Uh, that means that the governance is not fully in our control uh, to ensure that the data are secure, that copyright's being used effectively or protected, um, and so on. Uh, but then this is balanced maybe by the increased benefits, or by the benefits of increased quality uh, potential for reduced bias. Though, so again, great conversations about that today. Uh, and greater efficiency in delivering on our science mission if we embrace and learn how to use generative AI really effectively. And so the biggest risk that we identified early in our process was the risk of leaving AI on the table as we're figuring out what USGS should do. And, and if we don't use it, then we're missing out on some opportunities here. So now I can share with you our draft goals and objectives as we uh, move toward uh, finalizing these. Uh, we've identified these five goals. So develop a strong AI workforce, optimize our organization, uh, organizational approach, including how we st uh, structure our staff and what our policies are, 
a whole goal for ensuring responsible and trustworthy AI, a goal about ensuring that our technical infrastructure can support AI uses, and a goal for accelerating AI adoption and innovation through incentives and training programs and collaborations. And of these, I wanna highlight these six objectives that I'll talk more about next that I think are really relevant to the uh, scientific assessments. So one of these is about facilitating exploration and discovery. And I, I liked what you were saying earlier about the technical support units, maybe adopting an AI officer, someone who can support with lowering the hurdles to adoption of AI tools by, by others on the assessment team. Um, and also, at least for USGS, there's this technical need to keep up with advances in AI methods and software and uh, high performance computing options um, so that we can provide access to those to our staff. We talked about effective governance, and we thought that that might include both promoting innovation and providing guardrails at the same time uh, so that uses of AI are innovative, but are also safe and secure and responsible. And we talked about the utility of having both top-down policies and bottom-up smart choices, enabling staff uh, to have the, the skills and the, the culture uh, to want to pursue human accountability and responsibility for their uses of AI. Uh, and that was really pretty consistent with this Blau et al. PNS paper that came out this summer um, going through these principles of accountability and responsibility. Uh, there's this need that we acknowledge to adapt policies and procedures, but we started by saying really existing USGS policies are a great start toward this, and they are flexible in some useful ways. We have extra layers of peer review beyond what the journal process does, and I think that the National Climate Assessment does as well, and we find those generally to be you know, flexible in a way that we need to ensure that new uses of AI also get reviewed comprehensively. Um, and we also at USGS have, have systems in place for IT procurement data policies that add security to our uses of AI. Uh, but like I said, we know that there's this need for additional guidance and an example of that uh, was these four pieces of uh, guidance as frequently asked questions uh, that USGS put out to our staff this summer um, that address uses of generative AI um, and I'm guessing that these will be pretty consistent with what Lauren and Tony are talking about in the talks right after me, so I won't go into depth here, uh, but these include considerations of copyright protection and uh, secure uh, use of uh, private information and uh, human take, humans taking responsibility for the AI that they're putting out or that they're using and, and the products that they put out um, and uh, transparency in our uses of generative AI. One of our objectives was about managing risk comprehensively, by which we went balancing the risks and benefits of AI in the context of the risk tolerance that we have for a given activity. Um, and we really liked the NIST AI risk management framework, which has been brought up today um, in, in helping us think about multiple times types of potential harm to people, to organizations, to ecosystems, and then thinking about the full AI lifecycle from planning uh, to data collection, to building and verifying our models, and to using and interpreting the output of those models. And so thinking comprehensively about risk, we found to be really powerful. And then lastly, we uh, have this priority on equitable and trustworthy AI. And we thought that uh, some ways to address this would be to begin by acknowledging non-transparency of AI models. Um, and then we had a, a wonderful half hour about this earlier this afternoon, uh, but we talked about engaging with stakeholders throughout the process to understand their needs, to understand what they need to know about the model in order to trust it, uh, and uh, to get input from them on how to best develop those models to meet those needs. Um, and also we talked about the, the um, utility of model explanations. They have their limits, but uh, that's one way of looking into these models that can be quite helpful. And also the need to evaluate our AI models thoroughly in the context in which they're going to be used so that we understand their limitations. And the take home I wanted to share with you um, is to engage AI comprehensively. That's something that we found to be really important. Uh, we looked at this NIST uh, AI risk management framework and the, the life cycle of AI models. Similarly, there are the stages of assessment that we've been discussing today. Um, and so, you know, what I, what I came in this morning thinking I was going to share is that, that AI can appear in all stages of the assessment process. Clearly from today, you are on top of this and are talking about it in, in great ways. Um, and also what that means is that in each of these stages, there may be different policies, training, support, and priorities that might apply to different tools that might be applicable in these different stages. Um, and I was going to leave you with this idea that you might appeal to priorities, for example, the pillars of your strategic plan and thinking about what your risk tolerance is in each of these stages. Um, and I think that what the last couple hours have shown is that you are very much taking that approach. And so what I'm going to take on to USGS 
uh, is that based on what you all are doing, we must be doing it about right too and thinking about these stages. So thank you so much for your time and I'm looking forward to the rest. Thanks, Allison. Our next speaker is Laurel. Um, and um, sorry, Lauren. Uh, Lauren is deputy executive editor of Science Magazine, and uh, she's the primary administrative officer of the journals covering editorial policy and technology. Uh, she has a background in chemistry and is a member of the Council of Science Editors and the Society for Scholarly Publishing. Looking forward to hearing from you, Laura. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. That is a yes. <laughs> okay, thanks. I'm I'm thrilled to be speaking with you today. Um, I'm here to talk about the challenges and opportunities of AI in, in scholarly publishing. And uh, before we begin, I would just like to acknowledge my colleague, Val DeVinson, our executive editor at the Science Journals, uh, who actually was supposed to be giving this talk, but I am standing in for her today. So... I'm going to begin. So I'd like to start by discussing how we got here. At the science family, 2021 was a turning point for us. This was when an AI driven tool for protein structure prediction known as AlphaFold was designated our, our breakthrough of the year. Then about a year later, ChatGPT was released and we had to quickly develop some policies for the use of AI in the publication process. At this point, the landscape was moving very quickly and a range of positions emerged at major publishers. In contrast to our competitors, well, to some of our competitors, the science journals took a pretty cautious stance at first. Uh, as announced in a January, 2023 editorial called ChatGPT is fun, but not an author. But it's important to note here that we did this fully expecting to loosen our policies in time. We've always expected that AI would be part of the future of publishing, but we wanted to pump the brakes and give ourselves some breathing room to carefully consider the challenges and opportunities that this technology would bring. So what are these challenges and opportunities? Well, why not ask ChatGPT? So I actually, what you're seeing here is the results of a uh, prompt that I asked ChatGPT just yesterday about challenges and opportunities in scholarly publishing. And you'll see there's a, a, a reasonably robust list in each category. Um, but I adapted this slide from my colleague Valda, who asked the same question two years ago. And it was interesting to compare the responses over time. Uh, in the previous iteration, the challenges were pretty vague concepts and the opportunities were much more clearly defined and action oriented. But here though, we see more specific information in both categories, which perhaps isn't surprising given how much has been written on this topic in recent times. Importantly though, uh, we've got, you see here under challenge number two, a uh, bias is clearly listed as a challenge, which was not the case in the earlier iteration of this exercise. So the big question then is how best to balance these challenges with the potential opportunities. Turning briefly to AI and research, we've seen lots of exciting applications already, including protein structure prediction, computer programming, and weather modeling, just to name a few. But there are real challenges too. The study highlighted at the bottom of this slide is one good example. Uh, this study detected bias in a commercial algorithm used widely in the US healthcare system. In this case, health costs were used as a proxy for health needs, but more money was spent on wealthier populations. So their needs were incorrectly estimated as being higher than those of marginalized groups. So let's dive in then to AI and scholarly publishing. The number of tools for research, analysis, writing and editing has grown exponentially over the past couple of years. And you know there'll probably be three new tools by the time I finish this talk. So I've listed a very brief but representative sample here. I'm sure you're all familiar with at least some of these tools. I'm not going to go into the details of each one, but the point 
here really is that the tools really do have the potential to make research and writing easier. But as we see under challenges, they come with risks, including accountability, appropriate citation, accuracy, and completeness of the paper. So the fundamental question to ask ourselves is whether these tools will help more than they hurt or vice versa. The tools can help authors write more concise, grammatically correct text with stronger language, but they also hallucinate and may introduce substantive errors. In the end, authors are still accountable for their work. If they place too much trust in these tools, errors may not be uncovered until the peer review process is underway, which could then hurt the author's chance to publish their paper. Now looking at how AI can help with manuscript evaluation, we've tested out a couple of things at the science family. And so far we've seen the most promising applications in helping with tasks that are tedious and resource intensive and repetitive, <clears throat> excuse me, such as checking for plagiarism, figure manipulation, and compliance with open data standards. I've listed a couple of common tools here on this slide, some of which we are using at the science family, but these aren't the only ones. There are lots of good ones out there. These technologies can save time and they're scalable in workflows, but in all cases, it's important to note that they work best as complements to human evaluation, not in place of. As far as challenges go, there are a number, transparency, quality, accuracy, and then of course, confidentiality is a big one. When an LLM ingests the input data, what happens to it? If you're using a third party tool, you have to assume that confidentiality has gone out the window. To mitigate this, some publishers are considering building bespoke LLMs, but that's not easy to do. Doing so requires substantial resources and expertise, not to mention that it has real implications for the power grid. So touching briefly now on science communication, I don't have time in this talk to get into access models and the ramifications, but the main message I'd like to convey is that AI tools have the potential to help the public interpret scientific research. On the other side of the coin, training set biases are real and could have serious consequences, including the spread of misinformation. So to bring things full circle, here's where we've landed at the science journals. About a year ago, following the guidance of various organizations that I've listed on the next slide, we, res we have revised our editorial policies to permit the use of AI in manuscript writing so that so long as this use is explicitly declared in the paper. Regardless though, authors are still responsible for the accuracy of their content. AI tools cannot take this responsibility, so they're still not allowed to be authors of science papers. Additionally, we don't permit AI generated images, except in very rare cases, and we review those individually. And then peer reviewers cannot use LLMs to write their reviews for reasons of confidentiality, and also for the simple fact that it's not really peer review at that point. And I'd like to end with just saying that although we've we've set these policies and they've been tweaked a bit over time, we don't consider the case closed. For instance, in the area of AI generated multimedia, this area is moving rapidly and our position may change with the evolution of copyright law and industry standards on ethical use. Whatever the future brings though, we will consider, or we will continue, excuse me, looking to the organizations listed here for guidance to inform our own policies. So I'll leave you now with a selection of recent science covers that feature AI research applications. Thank you very much for this opportunity to speak today and please do reach out if you'd like to discuss any of this further. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Stick around, we'll have questions for you after Tony. So Tony Broccoli is Distinguished Professor of Atmospheric Sciences in the Department of Environmental Sciences at Rutgers, uh, formerly at NOAA GFDL. Uh, he's a fellow of the AMS and the AAAS. Thanks for being with us, Tony. My pleasure. And uh, 
My talk will probably be relatively brief. Uh, a lot of the points that I want to make have been made by Allison and especially Lauren. Uh, but I'm going to just tell you a little bit about how policies for the use of AI have evolved in AMS publications. So uh, first of all, many of you may be familiar with uh, the AMS family of publications, but in case you're not, here they are. Uh, the first AMS journal, the Bulletin of the AMS, uh, uh, began publication a little more than 100 years ago. And now we have about uh, 30,000 pages a year, more than that, I think, uh, across 12 journals. There's also a monograph series. And I mentioned the oldest journal, the newest journal is Artificial Intelligence for the Earth Systems, which debuted late in 2021 and really had more of a rollout in 2022, recognizing that uh, AI is important in the science we do, as you've, you've already spoken about. The guiding principle for our AI policies in AMS is that authors are fully responsible for the content of their manuscripts. And this echoes what you've heard um, in the previous presentation. So that's really our guiding principle. But at the same time, we've been aware of a practical consideration that there are no reliable methods that can determine if some or all of the content in a manuscript has been produced using AI tools. So keeping in mind that underlying principle and this practical consideration, here's where we've landed. And I'll tell you a little bit about how this has evolved over time. Our policies are based on a slightly modified version of the recommendations of the Committee on Publication Ethics. And this is about using AI tools and manuscript preparation. So first of all, we repeat that fundamental principle that authors are fully responsible for the content of their manuscript, even if some parts of that manuscript were produced by an AI tool. And that means they're also liable for any breach of publication ethics, such as plagiarism, inadequate uh, citation, et cetera. Uh, as Lauren indicated AI tools can't meet the requirements for authorship because they can't take responsibility. They're not legal entities, and there are all sorts of legal ramifications that follow from that. What we require authors to do is if they make substantive use of AI tools in the writing of a manuscript, production of images, or any other graphical elements of the paper, or in the collection of anal or an and analysis of data, they have to be transparent in disclosing how the AI tool was used and which tool was used. So maybe a little bit more liberal policy than what you heard from Lauren regarding images or graphical elements, but with that requirement that the use be fully disclosed. Now, Lauren also talked about um, the use of AI in reviews. And this was something that we were made aware of uh, at AMS uh, because of some instances in which uh, the use of AI was discovered in open review journals. And so again, we make the same points that you heard from Lauren, that first of all, peer review is supposed to be from peers. Uh, peer reviewers are supposed to explain the reasoning behind their evaluation so that there can be uh, an exchange of ideas. And also uh, manuscripts are uh, essentially proprietary information until they are published. And so that information shouldn't be shared and uploading it to an AI tool means you don't really know where it's going, even if it's something labeled as a safe AI tool. So as a result, we prohibit peer reviewers from using AI tools to evaluate manuscripts and prepare review reports with one exception. Uh, we think it's okay to use AI tools to edit a review report for language and clarity. But again, that must be something that a reviewer would disclose. And our thinking there is that uh, it's not uncommon for people to use editing services, particularly if they're writing a paper, but maybe also if they're writing a review to make sure that the language is clear. Perhaps the, the author of the paper or the review isn't someone for whom English is their first language. 
And in that sense, um, touching up the language with an AI tool uh, doesn't seem any less reasonable than using an editing service. However, um, we have to keep in mind our overall approach to this issue and what that implies going forward. First of all, we want to maintain our commitment to high quality and articles published in AMS journals. We want to develop policies, whatever they may be going forward, that follow from that guiding principle that authors are fully responsible for the content of their manuscripts. And we also need to recognize that there will be a need to develop or adapt specific policies in an environment where AI technology is advancing rapidly and there are evolving legal considerations. Many of you may be aware that there is a lawsuit in which the New York Times has alleged uh, copyright infringement uh, because of large language models uh, potentially having access to text from uh, their newspaper. So uh, depending on the outcome of some of these legal challenges, we may have to adapt the policies, we may have to change the policies that I've just told you about. Now, I want to finish by amplifying a point that uh, Allison made about human review. And in doing this, I'm, I'm telling you a little bit of a story. Uh, back in the spring, one of the chief editors of our journals uh, sent us uh, a couple of examples of AI use gone awry. And uh, one of these cases came from, from this journal, Radiology Case Reports. And here is the uh, text in question here, highlighted in, in uh, yellow. And you can see that uh, basically somehow the uh, response of the AI tool um, got pasted in, even though in this case, the response was essentially a non-response, a cautionary response. Now, when I saw this, when it was sent to me, I, I couldn't believe it was real. So I logged into our library's website and I downloaded this paper and I looked at it and sure enough, this was there. Now, if you were to go to that same journal today, what you would find is this article has been removed. And it's interesting, you see the first paragraph, it's been removed at the request of the editors in chief and the authors because informed patient consent was not obtained by the authors in, in accordance with journal policy. But then it also notes that the authors have used a generative AI source in the writing process of this paper without disclosure. And it says that's not the reason why the article was removed, even though it's a breach of journal policy. And then comes the understatement of the year. The journal regrets that this issue was not detected during the manuscript screening and evaluation process and apologies are offered to readers of the journal. Well, it wasn't detected by the authors. It wasn't detected by the reviewers. It wasn't detected by the editors and it wasn't detected if there was any copy editing that was done to that journal. So I bring this up because beyond the specific question of the use of AI, I think in an assessment process like the National Climate Assessment or any other important assessment, it's important to keep in mind that there are different levels of scrutiny that manuscripts receive prior to the publication process. And while this is an egregious example, and certainly uh, no one would cite a paper that had that text in it in uh, an assessment like the National Climate Assessment, I think it's also important to keep in mind that there may be other instances in which uh, content is being provided, published in a peer review journal where there may not have been sufficient scrutiny. And I think that's important for us to, to keep in mind. So with that, since I'm the only thing standing between us and some discussion, uh, I'll end it there. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you so much, uh, Tony, Lauren, and Allison, that really, really great trio of presentations. While I wait for other hands to come up, um, I want to ask your thoughts about um, 
generating scientific figures, uh, constraints and opportunities? Well, I'll, I, I, I'm interested in hearing what Lauren has to say because uh, science has, has taken a little bit more restrictive policy. I think where we thought about it was that uh, there may be a need for authors to try to make their figures more attractive and that there is the potential for some tools being used to make figures look better. Uh, obviously, that's a little bit different than using AI to generate data, generate information, generate uh, in, in, in uh, the AMS disciplines, we don't have so many cases of uh, AMS, of, I'm sorry, of AI being used to generate images that are conveying scientific information like a CAT scan would convey or a, 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 a scan of a crystal lattice or something like that. And I could see where there would be maybe more concerns about such uses. Yeah, I, I, we do have concerns and that's part of what informs our, our policies to be pretty um, buttoned up, I guess, about, about what we allow uh, or, or rather don't allow, but um, it, it, it's field dependent, I think. Um, and I might answer this question in a slightly different way. Um, one of the things that we're finding with so we use Proofig, which is a a tool for checking. It's it's sort of like authenticate for images. It checks for duplications and alterations and whatnot. And what we're finding is a lot of a lot of what we are pretty confident are honest mistakes in the way that figures are assembled. And you know, if if people are doing this manually and making mistakes, it's sort of a double edged sword. It, it it's possible that some of these tools will help with figure composition, um, but people aren't checking their own work now. And I think we worry about what will happen, you know, how much trust are people placing in these, in these tools? And are we going to see a proliferation of, of errors and problems? So, you know, for now we're, we're taking a conservative stance. Thanks, Lauren. Yeah, I was specifically thinking in the, the role of science communication that assessments play. Sometimes you want to use a figure from the primary literature, but maybe it's just too complicated or it looks ugly or, you know, and if you're fortunate enough to have a graphic designer on staff who can redraw it for you, great. Um, and maybe the TSU can do some of that, but I was, I was just wondering. Um, I see a bunch of hands, so we'll go to Karen. Yeah, I think I'm going to pick up on something that Allison said about risk tolerance. She kind of said that at the very end, and it, and it was something that I was thinking about the whole time uh, you were presenting, Allison. But and maybe this is a question for all three of you: is that seems to be kind of a key point here, right? In in terms of what you, what risks or what how far you're willing to take AI in your organization versus the U.S. GCRP. And I don't know if you could reflect on that and say yeah, we can take a risk and use this AI because we're not going to get sued. You know, uh, we don't have a, a you know, risk of being sued like the US GCRP. I don't know if, if you can maybe speak on that a little bit. I might just say that I can imagine different risk tolerances for different pieces of the assessment life cycle. And you might be perfectly willing to have the, the AI model give you wrong answers at the, uh, at the stage of literature where you're just discovering new papers because you have human oversight. Um, but that at the at the overall level of what kinds of uh, inaccuracies you're willing to put into the assessment, you might have a very different tolerance. Yeah, and I, I guess my thought is that the the key is really the the human review. You know that that where the real danger lies is if there isn't adequate human review of whatever is being produced. That's where the the risk is greatest. And uh, in an assessment, you know, given all the implications of, of assessments, uh, obviously it, there has to be a lot of care with regard to, to taking on inappropriate risks. Joel. Thank you. So um, 
question, Lauren, to you, you, you mentioned that the science journals do allow some text to be drafted by AI. And I wonder if you could elaborate on that and are there restrictions and does that text have to be identified in the publication? Thanks. Sure. Yeah. So we allow a limited use. Um, but yes, what we ask for is that any any text that was written or even enhanced via via AI tools be that be declared in the method section of the text. Um, and we also ask that the the version of the tool used in the prompt given are also explicitly stated. And we also ask authors to declare that upon submission. So it's right up front in their cover letter for editors to to see and have that context and not have to dig for it. Um, you know, it it's hard to know whether everybody is actually doing that. Um, you know, obviously in egregious cases like the one that, uh, that, that Tony pointed out where the paper actually said, you know, I'm an LLM, I don't know, blah, blah, blah that's that's very clear um we don't necessarily have a system in place to identify authors who might be doing this and not telling us but right now we're doing the best we can and we're continually looking at ways to uh, tighten our belts i guess thanks Stephen. yeah um this is i'm building off of what uh both lauren and tony said but want to point to Stacy or Ariella um, that in both cases um, they pointed out within the journal coming back to the foundational principle that the authors um, bear responsibility for for the ethics and can you just clarify in this conversation who is the author of the national climate assessment and and I my assumption is that it's you and therefore you're taking on that there's Thus, the uh, risk risk tolerance uh, level is set at a place where they are asking their authors within the journals to um, live up to that role. Um, that's a complicated question. I think that the USGCRP is ultimately responsible for the the text that is in the assessment. I do not believe that an individual author would ever be held individually responsible for anything. But that's not to say that their reputation and their personal lives are not impacted by their authorship on any given chapter. And so it is a team effort to make sure that no one is called out, held responsible, and dragged through the mud for any sort of misinformation that we give. Did you see that? Yeah. Okay. Osvaldo. I think the, the most important value of the NCA is the trust that the American society puts on the document. So this is an authoritative document that is, and therefore I want to highlight the asymmetry that exists between the opportunities and the risks. So if, it's, if we're going into, into literature search, if we miss one paper, nothing happens. But if we cite a paper that is wrong and then we have the wrong conclusions, the impact on trust is enormous. So it looks to me like a, this is a case that being conservative is a good strategy because it's, trust is very asymmetric. One error, and the whole trust of the NCA, it goes, disappears. And so I wanna highlight this uh, balance between uh, opportunity and risk in, in that trust is a, it's something that we built slowly throughout decades, but disappears in, from one day to the other. Thank you. Comments on that? I'll just make a quick comment. As a as a climate scientist, I, I, I couldn't agree more. I think we have seen how um, finding some kind of an error, trivial or otherwise, has been weaponized against climate assessments and against climate scientists. So I, I think that makes that conservatism well warranted. 
Yeah, thanks. Jane. Thank you. I wanted to follow up on um, Joel's question and the response. Um, so you, you ask for disclosure of whether um, an LLM has been used or an AI tool has been used um, and what the which tool it or tools it is and the prompt. And I'm wondering what you, I mean, the disclosure is great, but I wonder what you do with the other information since my understanding is that the what an AI tool produces is somewhat random. So I assume that it would be unlikely to produce an identical product to what an author using an AI tool would have gotten from it. And I, so I'm just wondering like of what aid to you is that? It, it is case by case, but I do, you know, it, it not only is it meant to be an aid to us in understanding, you know, what exactly, what, what questions the authors were asking and what, how much help or input they had from, from an LLM. Um, but it's also in the, we asked for it to be declared in the method section of these research papers. And, you know, that's out there for, for the public to consume when they're published. And, you know, it, obviously reproducibility is extremely important in research. And as you noted, you might not get the same response exactly, but I think there's a, a level of similarity that would be acceptable. And if uh, wildly different responses are happening, maybe that triggers research to go in a new direction or um, some other type of commentary on the paper. Um, so there, there are different reasons, but transparency above all. Aaron. Yeah, just really briefly, um, we and the TSU especially think a lot about intellectual property when it comes to producing things, especially figures. Um, and coming from the publication side and also the agency side in the case of Ellison, how do you all think of intellectual property and AI, especially images? And how, how would you deal with that? Since Tony and Lauren already weighed in a bit on their uh, journal policies toward uh, images, I'll just say that USGS has kind of a similar approach and, you know, restricting uses of image generation more than uses of text generation and refinement. And a lot of that actually comes down for us to the intellectual property question. It's something that I don't think the federal government has answers to yet, and we're playing it conservative on that as well. Thanks, Allison. Julie. Um, yeah, just kind of <clears throat> piggybacking off uh, I love what Osvaldo shared and, you know, thinking about that trust always being built, right, and how easily it can be lost, but then, you know, adding to that also recognizing that, you know, many are coming, many of those, you know, end users of, of the doc of the assessment are coming in very much with that trust deficit, right, and so when we think about levels of risk aversion, it's not even like at a neutral playing field, right? on that kind of level of deficit coming in with. And so calculating that risk also in that consideration. We have a few minutes left and I, I wanna pose a question about reviews. Um, last month in the Chronicle of Higher Education, there was an article uh, stating that in one field in particular, uh, it was estimated that 17% of peer reviews were written by uh, AIs. Uh, ironically, the field in which this is occurring is AI research. <laughs> so they recognize they have only themselves to blame. But, you know, as you look ahead to the vast task of getting NCA6 reviewed, um, and, you know, we, we really face, uh, we're, we're, we're maybe at the tail end of a huge crisis of peer review that, that kind of kicked off when a lot of potential reviewers in the early months of the pandemic were just dealing with the basics of childcare and so on. Um, but beyond just saying, don't use LLMs to help you review this, <laughs> what what have you been thinking? And what I'd be curious about, you know, advice from Tony, Lauren, and Allison about, you know, a couple of years from now getting really, well, or I guess probably a year from now, um, getting really good quality reviews from peers, not, not from an LLM. Uh, and and uh, yeah, again, it's one thing to say a policy, but but how do you go beyond the policy? 
Uh, I don't know if anyone noticed my face, just like terrified <laughs> um, by that question. Uh, you know, it's a reasonable question. It's possible the NCA five team did consider that, especially towards the end of the review, where you have a full draft of the of the paper and AI technologies existed already and were you know up and running. So I'd be curious to ask the rest of my team who's who's online if they had thoughts about what had happened in the last round. But I will say that we have a sort of um, a diversity of ways we collect information. Uh, we're, review of the of the product there's of course you guys and and the committee that will review the the um the report but we do a lot of in person engagements and we also track who is submitting comments and so there are occasions where a bot will go into the um the contribute site and put lots of stuff in and we have to find a way to get through that information in a reasonable way that meets the requirements that we have to respond to all comments um, and if it's somebody who used AI, but there's a person attached to it, we're still responsible for it. Um, that's just how the game is played. And so, you know, we have, the burden is on the authors who have to respond to every comment. And so we need to think about very deeply, you know, what it looks like, what what comments are look like. And if we even have the ability to identify if something has been AI generated or not. And I don't know if we have a function to do that yet, but it's definitely something on the table. Um, Aaron, Chris. I see Allison A has her hand up probably on this question. Well, can I, can we see if the NCA5 team did, did think about it? Aaron or Chris? I mean, I think it's definitely a consideration that, that we can talk about. Um, in terms of like how people submit things in a secure way and then how we how we present that to authors to respond to. Ariel, it's Mike. Um, I'm not aware that we were aware that we were being spammed by bots in NCA5. Um, I know that um, because of the way the review and comment site is set up, it's not easy for a bot to do it on its own. Um, but certainly you could create a comment and then you could, as an individual, you could stuff it in there. Um, and I also know that there are agencies that are currently being um, inundated by what appears to be AI generated comments on like rulemaking and stuff. And they're struggling to figure out how to deal with because you can generate a lot. You can you can essentially have like a denial of service almost to the agency by, by creating just massive amounts of comments. Um, we haven't had to deal with it yet, but it's certainly something we're talking with our agency colleagues to figure out how they're dealing with it and, and how might we deal with it if we come into that situation. Allison A, did you still have a comment? Sure, it, this headed in the direction where I have a little less to offer about external peer reviews, but I, I wanted to bring up that thought I shared earlier about the both top-down and bottom-up governance. Um, and I think there's probably an opportunity within the NCA team to cultivate that sense of responsibility among every single contributor to you know have them be openly sharing how they're using generative AI and whether that you know if their internal reviews happening. Um, being very transparent and, and getting getting peers to to reel in others on excessive uses of generative AI where it's not appropriate. Um, so I think that you can build a strong culture that will help with at least the internal side of that challenge. Thanks. Uh, last question, Allison G. I guess maybe this is not a helpful comment, but I not being somebody who is housed at an academic institution. Um, I think that like examining the incentives that exist and like some of the elephants in the room, why are people being pressured to like use generative AI to push all of this out? Um, and like are the right, not just like preventative thou shalt not, but are people being adequately compensated for their contributions? And like, to what extent is that going to be a necessary part of this? Like, it can't all be stick. There needs to be some um, acknowledgement of, I mean, Phil's comment also sparked it a little bit. Um, people have a lot of pressures on their time. And like, I got asked to review a whole like USDA program grant thing this summer. And I did it, but then at the end, I was like, well, geez, those were a lot of hours that I didn't bill. Um, so 
And and I think the landscape is changing. Like I'm not the only one who has not gone the traditional academic path. Those like tenure track positions are fewer and further between. And so that is going to sort of impact the whole pool of authors. Um, and it's probably just like important context. There's there's more global changes happening other than just the emergence of AI. And on that note, uh, I think that concludes this uh, session. So thank you very much, Allison, Lauren, and Tony. That was fascinating. Yeah, I just want to apologize for disappearing there. I got the blue screen of death on my computer. So some AI somewhere didn't like what I was saying, I guess, but uh, sorry about that. Thanks for oh, that. And I should have said that Tony is the publications commissioner for AMS. That's his, the important role that, that he plays that brought him here. So with that, we turn to the updates Me. from uh, USGCRP and, and ASEM. Um, yeah, and I just want to appreciate the the speakers that we just had to recognize that this is this conversation is happening in a broader ecosystem of people across the scientific enterprise who are engaged with thinking about AI and and quality and uh, of of an accuracy of the work that we are doing um, to across climate and other activities. Um, so thank you for thank you all for that. Um, so I am going to put in the um, in the chat. Um, a link to program materials, which are on the event website, but also distributed. Um, really going to go very briefly over some um, National Academies updates. And most of our time that would have been the National Academies uh, focus, we are giving over to um, the a briefing on a recent, very recently released report on designing a strategy to evaluate the National Climate Assessment. So very. Um, Another important uh, set of questions on uh, Ariella and USGCRP's <laughs> task list and um, speaks to some of the things that we've already been talking to about inclusion and, and engagement. Um, so just note that the updates that I'm gonna be giving are just a highlight and most of the materials are in, um, in what I shared um, in a written form. And then even with what I've, and shared in a written form, I realized I left out an important upcoming uh, meeting, uh, which is a workshop in November on the implications of artificial intelligence related data center electricity use and emissions, which is a topic that's come up a number of times already today. So with that, um, Caitlin, can you turn on the slides? Um, back, back a couple. Yeah, one more. And there should have been. Let me uh, share my let me share my slides. Um. Here. Um, so a couple of things that are the, the updates that we distributed in written form have information on uh, a couple of themes um, in, in the National Academy's work, uh, one on artificial intelligence, and then, um, then touching on a couple of um, areas that are particularly of interest to this group, of course, um, climate activities at the National Academy and with the uh, National Nature Assessment moving forward. We've also included information on biodiversity uh, related activities. Um, for my brief updates, I wanted to draw your attention to a couple of upcoming events um, that um, October 2, so next week, we're releasing a really important new study on a research agenda towards um, uh, opportunities and, and challenges, um, a research agenda around atmospheric methane removal. Um, and that, that report comes out next week and the uh, release webinar is at um, 2 p.m. And that same day, it'll be available on the National Academy's press website. Um, and then additionally, within the National Academies, we have a, um, a, a cohort group called the uh, New Voices in Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. And um, as part of their, um, their 
cohort. Um, they um, are talking with folks across the academies about uh, activities and topics of interest where they feel like their perspectives and engagement can uh, can build on work that's been do that's going on and um, that um, the new voices webinar this uh, this year is specifically leveraging the national climate assessment to empower communities so really how 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 can uh, the broader community work with and build in build on the the really important work that uh, has been done within USGCRP on the NCA um, to engage and and bring that out in into broader communities, um, which is very much connecting to um, the report briefing that we'll get in just a moment. Um, New studies um, that are ongoing now or just just starting um, in 2016, we released a study on. Um, attributing um, attribution, extreme event attribution for climate change uh, really is one of the most downloaded, if not the most downloaded study of the National Academies. Um, that, that as with AI, that field of attribution science has changed a lot in that time. And so we are, um, we are having a next iteration of that study that is just kick, kicking off and adding a couple of dimensions, including uh, legal dimensions um, and, as, and also looking at impacts. Um, we have other studies that have just started on cumulative impact assessment, the science of it behind those, and then within our um, education um, and, and behavioral and social sciences, um, what, is, what is education and curriculum uh, considerations for thinking about um, thriving in a changing climate. A um, couple, couple of reports that I want to bring your attention to. Um, the In June, we released a report on modernizing probable maximum precipitation estimation under a changing climate, um, and um, which is a, a measure that's used for safety and operation of safe operation and design and maintenance of dams, nuclear power plants, other critical facilities that we really don't want to see fail um, and in with extreme precipitation and understanding how the impacts are changing with a changing environment. Um, and then um, earlier this year, we released a community-driven relocation study, um, and there's a whole set of new resources that are available um, to support and build on that study. Um, so encourage you to take a look at those resources. Um, all right, let's go into the next one. Um, then I just wanted to draw, draw attention to a couple of activities that are in sort of advanced development. Um, and the first one is an agency working with a couple of agencies around a question of what are the impacts of a growing space industry on the Earth's atmosphere. So once we send things up into space, they don't just either stay there or, or just disappear, but um, looking at the issues um, that what are the current and future future effects of ro rocket launches, satellite reentry, and uh, related issues and research gaps associated with that. Um, and um, secondly, we are sort of as a bookend to uh, the probable maximum precipitation study. Um, we are um, have initial support from NOAA and the NIDIS program, the National Integrated Drought Information System. Uh, to build on a technical meeting that uh, that was a multi-agency and organizational technical meeting held in 2023 um, that looked at uh, research gaps and such and uh, but stopped short of recommendations and so they um, we're looking to hopefully this fall launch a study on um, considerations of drought under changing climate. How do you think about um, baselines and characterization um, all to deform, inform decision making um, when the underlying baseline and, and, and framework um, uh, is changing under a changing climate and non-stationarity. Um, with that, um, I'd like to um, introduce Kai Lee. Uh, Kai is uh, in the chair of the committee that produced the report on uh, designing a strategy to evaluate the national climate assessment. And um, I'll have Kai, Kai introduce himself and his connection to this group and uh, give us a brief briefing on this report. So Kai. Thank you, Stephen. 
Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, some years ago, I sat on your side of the table as a member of this committee, and it's great fun to be back among you uh, and with some familiar faces uh, around the table. Uh, of course, the table has now given way to this internet uh, <coughs> uh, constellation of faces, uh, but in, in any case, it's it's nice to see uh, it's nice to see familiar faces. Uh, as Stephen just mentioned, um, I chaired the committee. Uh, that wrote the report summarized in your meeting materials, the report called Developing a Strategy to Evaluate the National Climate Assessment. One of the members of that committee, Jessica Kronstadt, is uh, is also, uh, quote, in the room, unquote, with you. And I think Jessica would <clears throat> confirm my judgment that uh, nobody, nowhere in our discussions did we think as uh, the population of users of the National Climate Assessment as including large language models. Um, but times change and we're already outmoded, it turns out. So what we were uh, what we were asked to do uh, in the committee was to prepare a strategy for designing an evaluation. So this is a much more indirect kind of activity uh, than, than actually evaluating the NCA uh, and or even to put forward a design. Instead, what we were asked to do and what we wound up doing was to create a proposal to the USGCRP uh, and its leadership for a process of thinking about a design, selecting partners and an evaluator to work with them and specifying the intentions of the program in creating the National Climate Assessment as both a document and as a process of engagement. And uh, <clears throat> I should say that we are uh, from the very beginning, uh, much in the debt of the USGCRP and of Mike uh, Cooperberg for, for bringing this topic up. Uh, the conversation you've just had included a statement uh, by uh, several of you, uh, starting with Osvaldo, uh, about the importance of scrutinizing the content of the National Climate Assessment. And indeed, there's been tremendous effort focused on that over the course of the National Climate Assessment over the past quarter century. But as the National Climate Assessment has uh, served more and more audiences, uh, as the importance and, uh, and relevance of climate change has expanded uh, in society, there's actually been no formal evaluation of the users of the National Climate Assessment and the uses to which they put it. Uh, and, uh, and and so I th I think this our report is important as a marker of uh, attention now being turned to the question of use of what difference does the NCA make uh, in understanding and in decision making uh, with respect to climate uh, and and which is obviously the you know the, the, from a policy standpoint it's the it's the bottom line it's where we're headed for. Our report thinks about the use question uh, by creating or proposing a theory of change, or proposing that the USGCRP develop a theory of change uh, using the device in evaluation uh, practice called a logic model. The logic model is a kind of flow diagram. Uh, and what the NCA is, in, it asks, what is the NCA intended to do? With whom does it work? With what outcomes, what outcomes are being sought? And how does it work against a complex and dynamic context as climate change continues to rise in salience? In thinking about this, uh, the committee turned toward thinking about, thinking in terms of a network perspective. That is, we came to think of the users of the NCA as anchors in their own networks of communication. In this way, the knowledge of the NCA does not simply diffuse outward like a, an ink drop uh, dropped into a glass of water, but through a, a complex structure of networks uh, in which information is taken up by direct users. The direct users in turn relay it or select it or modify it and then share that with their own uh, with their own network. Our report 
identifies the literature for mapping such a, such a structure that we call a network of networks. The outline, <clears throat> the report in general, concludes that what is needed for an evaluation design is a multi-step process in which the adaptive design is an adaptive uh, feature that is changing, the, the design of the evaluation should change as more and more is learned. Evaluation, in our opinion, needs to be ongoing and iterative, both as a part of the NCA process and, and also standing back from that process to provide a perspective on how the NCA is being used, how it is and isn't useful for decision-making, and very importantly, who is being left out. Left out both in terms of the audiences and left out in terms of engagement in the process of creating the NCA. Once again, let me emphasize that involvement of the USGCRP uh, leadership is central. It is central because they are the people who can clarify the intentions of the NCA to identify their key partners and to develop the theory of change. That is what we call the logic model. This is a big task and the leadership of the USGCRP are busy people. I see Mike nodding his head. And it is important, therefore, to work in stages because we don't yet know enough to design a full-scale evaluation in detail. So we try to think a little bit about initial steps that should be manageable. For example, to focus on a substantive area such as the interaction of climate with water or with energy, or to develop case studies such as looking at how a single agency uh, has used the NCA in climate services, or focusing on a key partner NGO such as Climate Central as they prepare and relay climate information uh, to their uh, multitude of audiences in the media. These ev initial evaluations can guide improvements in the NCA process and the assessment that results. So it's important to start with something, to, to bite off something that you can chew, uh, but even in selecting that bite, you can you can answer questions that are already uh, already relevant to the operations of the NCA and in particular to NCA 6. Since the threat of global climate change was initially recognized in 1957, federally supported science has formed the foundation of our understanding of and responses to climate change. The NCA has been the authoritative statement of that understanding for more than a quarter century. Evaluation of how the NCA is used can help to guide the nation as the climate continues to change and as humans grapple with the many implications of that reality. Let me ask Jess if she has anything to, to add. Uh, we'd both be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Kai. I think the thing that I would add is really the importance of focusing on what how the evaluation will be used as well. So one of the questions we were asking ourselves and, and you know, from our conversations with colleagues at USGCRP was that, that there's this joint desire to understand sort of the, how can we have information that will help us improve the NCA going forward. And so really thinking through, and that's why Kai talked about a range of different methodologies that you might apply some of which will help with different aspects of that. So that case study piece is really getting into the nitty gritty. It might not give you a broad sense of what the impact is as a whole or a quantifiable sense, but it could give really valuable information about what makes effective dissemination and how could we um, push on that dissemination and have it, you know, advance it further. And so I think one, you know, any, as, as any effort to evaluate the NCA proceeds, really the first important question is to really ask, what would we do with this information? And then um, this report provides some guidance on how, depending on what those needs are, how you might go about um, constructing that theory of change, those evaluation questions that are gonna guide it, and then what methods are most likely to be matched to that. Uh, but really that the first step is really thinking through, what will you do with this information at the end? Mm -hmm. And last thing I should say uh, before turning to your questions is uh, how much we were helped and guided by the staff of the academies, uh, by Stephen, uh, by Brad Cheney, uh, and by Lindsay Moeller. Uh, we might have gotten, I'm not sure where we would have gotten without them, but we got to where we got with their help uh, at every step of the way, and we're grateful for that too.
Any questions? So the report is available uh, for free download from National Academies Press. I put a link in the in the chat. Um, but uh, any questions for for Kai, Jessica, uh, Jane, and then Mike? Thank you. Um, first is just some clarification: is is the evaluation to be descriptive or normative? And if it's normative, how would it? I mean that the USGCRP and the NCA can't do everything, and so how would it set priorities among all of the choices that could would likely emerge um, in that kind of an exercise, and who makes those decisions? And I sus I suppose a related question is what metrics would you use um, to evaluate? So I. Uh, I'll ask Jessica to uh, to correct the many mistakes I'm about to make, but it's uh, uh, I think the what the strategy we've called for is both descriptive and normative. Uh, it is descriptive in the sense that uh, we are we're turning to the USGCRP and putting them in the hot seat to say what it is that they have intended. That is, uh, uh, what is it, what is it that the U.S. Global Change Research Act of 1990 the mandate that's that's provided uh, and to provide a, a national assessment uh, of, of the state of climate science, that's the, that's the charge. How do they interpret that in terms of the key audiences they engage with and uh, which the purposes that they're trying to serve? Uh, it is normative in the sense that, that uh, an evaluation should tell them uh, not only who are the users, that's the descriptive part, but are there are there are those uses being well served? Um, so in the user category, there's the question of who are not users, uh, as I mentioned before, who's left out in the process. Uh, that's a normative question uh, <clears throat> as well as a descriptive one. Um, and then there's the question of whether this the NCA, and the many documents and sources of information that it leads to, uh, do they actually provide uh, the basis for better climate decision making? Um, and and that's that is a normative judgment. Um, as for where the, uh, you know, I, I suppose, uh, well, let me stop there and and ask Jessica if, if, to to say further what, what it is that we do. Yeah, I think, and that's why I think we grounded it in that, that first step is for USGCRP and its key partners to really think through what that theory of change is, to say, what is it that we hope to accomplish? What do we theorize are the most effective pathways to get there? And then use the evaluation to test whether those pathways are indeed effective, are having the um, effects that were planned, are having unintended effects. Um, to the extent that there's the ability to do some compar comparisons in terms of you know, what are the relative efficacy of these different mechanisms, but it really does come down to that question. So I think, um, not to say that we dodged the question of finalizing the set of metrics, we have some sort of proposed metrics in there, but they really are dependent on an understanding of what the aims are. I think in terms of all of the potential audiences, again, we laid out, a, um, there are so many potential audiences. And so we laid out some criteria for determining which ones to prioritize. Some of those criteria are again, really tied to, you know, that theoretical phase of, of how we think we're gonna have the desired impact. So which are the key levers to that? Some of the criteria are much more practical in terms of how easy is it to access this particular population and survey them. So. Um, we tried to really lay out how one might go about thinking of coming to the answers to those questions um, and what those questions are, rather than stating definitively, you know, these are your priority audiences, um, or this is the priority metric. Um, so Mike and then Kathy, and then we'll turn back to USGCRP for their updates. Yeah, and recognizing I'm using up my own time for the updates. Um, I, I, we should have thought, we should have, what happened here is very predictable, that we asked the National Academy to tell us how to do an evaluation, and the National Academy said, you guys need to figure out what you want to know before you can do an evaluation. Um, it's like, right. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out, in case um, Ariel has run out of the room screaming, that we 
do not necessarily expect that the current NCA6 team is going to actually design the evaluation. They've got their hands full. Obviously, they'll have to be involved in, in what we're doing and thinking about, but um, Ariella, don't leave yet. That's not, I don't think mm -hmm. we're going to make that your job. Um, and, but I really, what I wanted to say to Jessica and Kai and, and through them to the their committee members is how much we appreciate the time and thought and effort you put into this. And you have given us a, a, a framework and a roadmap for, for moving on. And we do need to do this. This is It's an obvious thing that like why it took us five NCAs, actually, it was a long time to get here. And you know, why we haven't uh, moved on this faster is only the federal government could explain why. But this is something we need to do. The, the National Climate Assessment needs to do it. USDCRP needs to do it. And we really appreciate the background you've provided us to get started on that. Thanks. Uh, so, Kathy? Yeah, I um, really appreciated this presentation. And I just wondered what thoughts you'd given. So it's a strategy to evaluate. And who is this a self-evaluation done by GCRP? Or is this going to be another task for the National Academy to do because they do reviews and then reviews of reviews? Um, ha have you given thought to the process? Kathy, we, we have. We've talked extensively with the National Academies about this. And I believe, and National Academies, please correct me, I believe that we've agreed that what has happened so far is the appropriate role for the National Academies, that the implementation of an assessment is not the appropriate role for the National Academies. Um, and it's also not something that I think doing a self-evaluation is probably not the point. Our, in my head, let me just say that. In my head, we would farm this out to a professional. You know, I mean, not you know, a professional organization, a professional uh, group that does this sort of living, but we be, we need to give them a, you know, we need to answer the questions that the committee has posed to us to be able to do that. Thanks. And with that, Mike, I'll turn it back to you. <laughs> okay. So there are seven of us that are going to try to use uh, now 15 minutes. Um, so we're going to go very, very quickly. Um, and I'll, we'll skip over a lot of things quickly and you can come back and ask us questions. So let me start by by saying thank you um, to our, our outgoing uh, co-chair, uh, Phil Moat, for your service to the program and for the incoming or the, the, the current co-chairs, Julie, Deb, and, and Sarah. Thank you very, very much. We rely on this committee. You are our uh, our key formal window to the outside world. It's very important and we've enjoyed working with you and look forward to continuing to work with you. Um, the message you're gonna hear from USGCRP over the next several updates is one of expanded mission, expanded scope, expanded uh, expectations of us, from, you know, within us and, and from us. Um, expanded membership, we, we welcome DHS and HUD uh, in 2023. Expanded scope, with this expansion to, to actually deal with the full scope of global change research uh, as, as evidenced by the National Nature Assessment and expansion into the coordination of climate services beyond just coordinating research, but moving into the coordination of climate services with the establishment of the new subcommittee on climate services and the new deputy director for, for climate services. That's, we're, we're really, really excited um, and thrilled with this expanded mission for the program and, and having a lot of fun doing that. So with that very short introduction, let me hand, hand this off to Heidi Roop. Heidi is the new Deputy Director of USTCRP for Climate Services and the OSTP uh, Assistant Director for uh, Climate Services. Heidi, floor is yours, thanks. Thank you, Mike. Thanks, you saved me a bunch of word salad with all my titles. So um, I'm Heidi Roop, I'm helping to coordinate um, the development and delivery of federal climate services and the auspices of the USGCRP. Um, we have been very busy um, in part, and I have here with me a co-chair of our subcommittee on climate services who will share about some of the overarching work, but um, we have established a, a climate services technical working group, which is an interagency group that's starting to develop a series of priorities and activities um, in part uh, building upon the great advice you all shared with us in previous conversations and meetings around climate services. So trust that we do circle back to our meeting notes um, and the abundance of thought um, and feedback that you provide. So thank you for that. Um, just as three quick highlights to um, hopefully seed some questions. Um, we're currently circling around developing activities around how we enhance the capacity building efforts for federal agencies to develop and deliver climate services and to learn from one another. 
We are seeking and working to think about how we advance usable data for risk management and decision making and thinking about how we leverage the collective expertise of our subcommittee on global change research. So have lots of generative conversations happening there. And we're working a lot on thinking about how we enhance both federal and non-federal engagements and partnerships. That's been an area where we've been focusing a lot lately um, to the extent that we're able, um, have been engaging in a lot of state conversations with resilience officers and other parties, as well as thinking about how to build more robust connectivity with public and private sector um, in the development and delivery of climate services and really understanding needs and how federal data are being entrained in decision-making and a variety of contexts and sectors and scales. And so with that, I'm going to pass it to Emily Silek glassman our, one of our co-chairs of the Subcommittee on Climate Services. Hi, my name is Emily Silek glassman I am one of the co-chairs of the Subcommittee on Climate Services. Um, and it's a, a real pleasure to get to be here in person with you all today. I just wanted to say, I it, previously, I used to serve as one of the many hats I wore was as an executive secretary for a federal advisory committee. So I appreciate just how much work goes in to doing the logistics, um, planning such a thoughtful agenda, and then what will ultimately happen in capturing the recommendation. So um, I really am one of the many people who really appreciates the work that you all are doing because it's, it's not a light load. Um, and I'm here really also wanting to convey thanks on behalf of our other um, co-chair who couldn't be here today, um, but uh, Samantha Medlock, uh, who's the FEMA Assistant Administrator for Resilience Strategy. Um, so together, she, Heidi, and I uh, are, are trying to steward this effort forward, and it's, it's a great team. So I wanted to provide a couple of additional highlights and then also maybe sprinkle in a couple of uh, things, morsels for thought for things that would be great to get input on um, as we try to go from nascent to less nascent, right, <laughs> as, a, as a subcommittee. So um, one thing that's been really helpful and productive is that in each subcommittee meeting, um, we've had one uh, agency present on their experience in navigating through the climate services. Um, so we have a few new agencies at the table for GCRP. We have HUD, we have, um, uh, so that's Housing and Urban Development. We have the General Services Administration or GSA. We have um, the Department of Homeland Security, right? So we have these agencies that may use quite a lot of climate information in their decision making, but haven't traditionally necessarily been in the global change research setting. So it's been, I think, incredibly helpful to hear their perspectives in terms of what they're using today, what challenges they're facing, and what why they're at the table, what do they want to get out of this subcommittee. And I would say, I think what we're hearing in some sense is a bit of a microcosm of, of what the challenges are writ large, um, which was kind of the intent of, of, of doing this in the first place. But, you know, how when folks have identified a tool, is there a better tool out there? Is that the most appropriate tool? How do they get the specificity for their specific use case when a tool was maybe meant for many different use cases? And, and so it's been leading to some great discussion. So uh, things that I think would be great to get input on maybe in a future meeting, you know, so there are so many things that fall within the scope of climate services um, and we want to do it all. And we, of course we would like to do it all right now, but but understanding that some things have to come before other things. Um, I think for us figuring out how we're gonna balance the staging of, of uh, time for mitigation services and adaptation services, understanding those are involved different communities of practice, um, different expertise, right? Different stakeholders. Um, and another thing is uh, balancing how much we're spending time on, on building those closer connections between federal agencies, which is largely, I think, what we've been doing as we you know first get this subcommittee up and started, but knowing that at some point, we're also going to have to really spend a lot of time engaging with other partners, right? Um, whether that's um, nonprofits, for-profits, state, local, tribal, territorial entities, but without losing right that kind of mesh making and building of connective tissue within the federal uh, within the federal family, so those are a, a couple of things that I think we're thinking about. In, in case you all have have thoughts or want to chew on that for for future meetings, so at this point I want to hand this off um, to Maria um, uh, Ula, um, co-chair of the Subcommittee on Global Change Research and Program Director in NSF's Division of Research, Innovation, Synergies, and Education. Okay, so my time's up. 
<laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Emily. I appreciate it. So um, I want to reflect what has been said before. We're really excited that we've actually been able to expand this purview um, to include climate services. I think we we see the real connection between the research to the services and and. Um, we want to thank actually OSTP for great wisdom of putting th these two groups together. Um, we've been, so Gretchen Goldman and I um, stepped up earlier in, I think it was January of last year, um, to kind of lead the, the SGCR. So I can have to say that now and not USGCRP. Um, so what we've been doing, very similar to what Emily and Sam have been doing, is to talk to the agencies and to understand from the perspective of our, what we would refer to, and I hate this term, but um, more of our user agencies, um, you know, not the, the NOAA, the NASA, the, you know, the people who are going to be using the research, um, what challenges they have, try to understand, you know, what are the questions that are really critical to their mission that research really needs to help inform. So we're trying to do very similar thing. We, we're calling it bridging the gap. Um, and we've started and with since April, we've had four four talks right now. Um, and we're compiling uh, a picture of the common themes that are running through these discussions. Um, obviously, we're not finished yet because we have what, nine more to go? No, 10 more, 11 more to go now that we're 15. Um, but we're looking at research and information about climate change and infrastructure. So a lot, you can imagine DOT, you know, that's a big issue for them. Um, also, let's see, where am I? Uh, decarbonization, um, adaptation and resilient metrics. So to understand, you know, how these things actually, are we doing what we need to do? Climate um, migration and changing patterns of extremes and their impacts um, are very, very important to multiple agencies. So we have several threads that we're kind of linking together. And again, um, I wanna say thank you very much to Julie Morris, who has gone through and created this, this database spreadsheet that is actually helping us track all of this stuff together. Um, and we have also at our annual meeting in May, we heard very clearly um, that people valued the breakout discussions that, that we had on emerging science opportunities, um, fundamental in, um, innovation in mitigation, and separately in adaptation um, and, this, and science to action. So we did four of these. Um, and we're continuing these conversations, starting with the first two topics, to go use part of our a monthly meeting to actually do a deeper dive in there and, and to keep that those conversations um, going. Um, we've also had a couple of new interagency working groups that have become part of USGCRP. So the umbrella, the working groups are where we, you know, the rubber really meets the road and gets things done. And they actually are um, reflective of research and services. So we've had a couple of um, new ones stand up. Um, and they are climate um, engagement and capacity building, working group on national security, um, and a task force on sea level change, urban systems, and climate change, and the TWIG, which we, of course, we need another acronym, but it's the Climate Services Technical Working Group um, that Stacy, or excuse me, Emily and Heidi um, talked about or well. So without that, now I'm handing to Stacy, um, who's the Deputy Director for Research at USGCRP. Thank you so much, Maria. I'm happy to share that yesterday at Climate Week, USGCRP released the Climate Literacy Guide. So this is the third edition. Um, it was first uh, released in 2008. <laughs> <laughs> and then it was updated in 2009, but it hasn't been updated since 2009. And now it is. Um, this guide is written with educators, communicators, and decision makers in mind. The previous version uh, was used to develop the United States Next Generation Science Standards, which were helped to guide and inform STEM teaching grades K through 12. Um, and this third edition, we're really excited, reflects recent advances in our understanding of climate. 
Um, so it inc includes new types of knowledge about the climate system in addition to the physical climate science, which were in the previous ones. So now it includes local and indigenous knowledges, social and cultural contexts, the social sciences at large, climate solutions, and climate justice concepts. Um, another really exciting announcement to share is that last this past Monday, uh, we released sealevel.globalchange.gov. So check it out. It's a fun tool. It represents the first whole of government resource for coastal residents and decision makers on sea level rise projections, associated impacts and adaptation measures. So this couples a dynamic delivery of the latest research on sea level change with some educational content. Um, and this data is drawn from the 2022 interagency sea level rise technical report. Um, and this is just a really exciting example of what can be done when all of the agencies come together, they share the capabilities and they work jointly to, to get something out. So take a look at the site. It's beautiful. It's wonderful. I'm really excited about it. Um, and lastly, I, I'm happy to share that USAID has helped us uh, translate some other materials into Spanish. So the NCA6 website is now in Spanish. We have an overview podcast from NCA5 now in Spanish and the NNA Zero Order Draft, which is out for public comment. Phil will talk about that in a second, is also fully translated into Spanish. So excited to hit new communities with that. And with that, I turn to Phil. Thanks. Okay. Um, so, um, good afternoon. Um, I'm Phil Levin. I'm the director of the National Nature Assessment, and it's really great to see you all virtually, or really, I should say, it's great to see your names in a black box for many of you. Um, and thanks, I should say, for the really stimulating discussions today. It's really been interesting, and, and I've learned a lot. Um, I have a couple key updates from the NNA that I wanted to share today. Um, first, um, with heartfelt thanks to our dedicated authors, the incredible U USGCRP staff and our federal steering committee and all the participating agencies, I'm excited to share that the zero order draft of the National Nature Assessment was published a few days ago in the Federal Register. It's open for 45 days for public comment. This is a major milestone for the NNA and I would have never imagined that a year and a half ago, I would be saying that reaching zero could feel so big, but it's truly a huge uh, moment for us. Um, so really, really excited. Um, the authors are really eager to see how the key topics they've prioritized in the zero draft resonate with a broad audience. Given the constraints of the assessment, each chapter could only focus on around three topics. So some tough decisions had to be made and we're looking forward to seeing public reactions to those choices. To gather additional input, we're hosting a series of in-person engagement events across the country, including in Washington, D.C., which we did last week, Georgia, Seattle, Michigan, Arizona, Hawaii, California, and maybe more. Additionally, um, we're doing a, a ton of uh, virtual events. In total, uh, we think there'll be about uh, a couple dozen events in the 45 day public comment period. Our first session, as I said, was held last week. At, um, it was at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History. It was a huge success, I think. Um, I was really excited to see that attendees ranged from retirees to high school students. And there was academics, agency representatives there and NGO leaders. And the feedback we received there was really invaluable. So I'm really looking forward to the many engagements we have coming up. We're really looking forward to engaging with you all in November as we continue discussions on the zero order draft. And as we prepare for the third draft, which will come out in a bit over a year, we've developed a draft statement of task for the National Academies review, which will happen at that time. Um, it's currently being reviewed by our lead authors to make sure that we've, we've captured their concerns. Um, once that feedback is incorporated, the document will be forwarded to Stephen. The review prompts that we're developing will echo those that were used for the National Climate Assessment uh, and last time and focus on really some big questions like, does the draft reflect the current state of knowledge of nature and its benefits? Is it scientifically rigorous and is it accessible to our diverse audience? To ensure thorough review, we're really gonna need a diverse ad hoc committee with expertise 
across environmental sciences like ecology, evolution, and genetics, but also social sciences, including anthropology, political science, sociology, environmental justice. Additionally, folks who have expertise in public health and humanities will be critical. So we're really looking forward to working with the committee and staff to ensure that this review is thorough, rigorous, authoritative, and useful. And thank you again for your continued support of the NNA and really, I should say, all USGCRP activities. And that's it for me. Not finished yet. There's me. Um, <laughs> so um, the NCA6 is on track. And we have a new table of contents, which we published about a month or a month and a half ago on our website. You can look it up on your search engine, just put in NCA6 and it'll pop up. Um, it's a really exciting new table of contents. There's new organization, there's new chapters and there's new newly reformulated chapters. Um, so we have two foundational science chapters, um, physical science and social science, and they're at the forefront on equal footing. Yes, very exciting, at least for me. Um, it's followed by response chapters, mitigation and adaptation, and a brand new chapter on the science of response management, which is a not really a science, but it's a catch-all for questions of how do we know that we've actually changed? How do we know that we've become more resilient? And how did we make that happen? So that's a really exciting new body of literature we're hoping to capture. Then we have a new national security chapter in our national topics. We have a rural communities chapter, which has been pulled outside of the ag chapter. And we have two reformulated chapters on urban communities and on nature and ecosystems. All of the chapter leadership for the 32 chapters is in place and they're currently putting their author teams together. That's really hard work. It's very cool work. And um, hopefully you'll be able to see those in a couple of months when they've started writing and have their zero order draft. And we can say the same thing that Phil said. It feels good to get to zero. Um, and then I just wanted to close off today by saying thank you on behalf of the whole team. I found today's discussion to be really rich and engaging. I feel like I learned a ton and the questions that I now have are not the questions that I came in with, um, which I think is really positive, right? So I've learned something, I've evolved just today and I, I think my colleagues have too. We've been on chats behind the scenes. <laughs> um, I'll just say that when I go home tonight, I think the two questions I have is, are we ready for AI, but is AI ready for us? Um, I think that's another question that I have. Um, and so um, I hope we can talk about that tomorrow. And I really look forward to continuing the conversation and the thoughtfulness you brought today, tomorrow. That's it for us. Many, that was a lot, and and there's we're only able to ever touch on a portion of what USGCRP is doing. We work with them closely to uh, try to bring the things that are most salient and most uh, the biggest questions that they have um, to for to, to this group to help them as they're thinking through that. Um, but with that, um, questions for any of the folks from USGCRP or up around any of the topics that were raised, uh, Joel, and then Osvaldo. So for wow, this is I'm blown away. This is all very impressive. So th this is this is great. To see a lot of this. Um, last time I believe it was the last meeting we did talk about the coordination of the uh, climate services. So I'm very pleased to see this committee set up. And I'll sort of risk of re repeating myself. I realize you're at the end. You probably don't have a lot of coercive force. You you can get people to talk to each other. Um, babies more. I'm not realizing, but I think that's great. I think even getting and and particularly I think from the point of view of users who kind of feel a little beleaguered having all these different uh, uh, or outreach organizations. I think that's a, that's a very positive step. And then I have a question if Mike is still there. Um, first, congratulations to Phil on getting the National Nature Assessment to zero order draft. Look forward to reading that. But also, Mike, you mentioned you're looking at other global change issues. Could you elaborate on that? Thanks. Sure. Thanks. Um, Jane has made it very clear to us, and, and this is not, we're not being dragged along, but very clear to us that the U.S. Global Change Research Program is focused almost exclusively on climate for 32 and a half years. Um, and what, so what you're seeing is, is the first step of that with the National Nature Assessment. But I think what you're going to see from that assessment is a renewed, uh, an expanded attention from USCCRP on things like biodiversity. And that's not just somebody else's problem. It, it's, you know, it's our problem. Land use change you know, where people are, where, where species are, how we interact with them. 
um, all those things I think you're going to see becoming part of USGCRP's um, daily, you know, bread and butter, not just um, something that we we nod to. Actually, can I jump in really quickly? Just um, I want to um, say that I think it's really um, important that we recognize that we're not looking at climate only as climate. I think it's really important that we're really trying to embrace a systems approach here that, you know, all of the things are relevant, right? So it's not just a climate change, it's a global change program. And with the advent of climate services, I think what we're aiming for is to really take the knowledge that we have and make it actionable. So we are always talking about being end to end. I think with this, um, this great group that we have now in that connection, I think we'll be able to be accomplished the end to end. My two cents. First, congratulations. I think you are accomplishing a lot. And, uh, and I have an only brief comment. I think we had a whole session uh, six months ago on climate services. And in my impression is if I had to uh, describe what I saw is that most of were, were services to help Americans to adapt to climate change. That's the way I would relate that session. But now I heard Emily and Maria just dropping the word mitigation. And, and during that session, I was uh, trying to emphasize that the, we need climate services for mitigation, that mitigation, there's a lot of people in the US that are doing mitigation. And it's kind of the wild west because some of them are truly doing valuable mitigation. There are other, they are not. They are, there's like, we have an FDA that tells you that this Tylenol that you buy in, in CVS is gonna help you with your headache. It, we don't have anything like that for mitigation. And the, the market is gigantic. It's an enormous amount of money for which uh, users need some guidance. There are a lot of, Microsoft wants to put billions of dollars into mitigation, but they don't know if what they are investing is, is doing what they, they have to. Uh, and this is a problem from the US, it's a global problem. We wrote a paper in December 2023 about Australia, uh, and they have the same problem. The Australian government is willing to give money to farmers. The farmers are happy to take the money, but nobody cares about carbon in that loop. If they are, sure. what they're doing is really uh, uh, sequestering carbon. Thanks. As, as long as, as the well, money want, flows. I'm going to jump in with two other questions. Do you have one final statement you want to sure. make? Yes. Um, mitigation. Mitigation. Emily, can I, can I respond to that really fast? I think this is why it is so excellent that you, we have both the research and services within USGCRP because this is an area where any notion of developing a service would take will take a tremendous amount of research for benchmarking, technology development, uncertainty, quantification, communication of that information, right? The whole gamut. And so I think um, I think it's tremendous that we have these working groups that are working to both ends, to all these ends, because they're very incredibly complementary and necessarily tied together. So we have uh, two Julies, Julie M and then Julie V. Uh, thanks. Yeah, this is awesome to see the, uh, the rising seas changing coasts. I'm realizing we either have to change our rising voices changing coast project name or come together somehow. <laughs> um, but I, so something I was thinking a lot about when, during the conversation about the evaluation process, going back to Kai, what Kai was sharing, and so much of the theme today around um, the intentionality of process, and this is probably not going to be very popular, but I think the elephant probably more in my head <laughs> than in the room is considering especially what's happened in the context of the Academy's co-production study. Um, I think it, it's really important to think about as, you know, NCA and GCRP and others are working, you know, of, okay, here's the, we're bringing in, you know, different knowledges, we're bringing in ideas around justice, you know, like 
what the purpose in, is in that and who it serves. And so that the discussion around metrics and who is going to determine what those metrics are and that kind of consideration and how you determine those indicators I think is going to be essential of how is it then being considered authentic and genuine to meeting the purpose in a way that's really transparent and clear to the multitude of you know audiences and users um, who might consider that evaluation and consider the the trustworthiness moving forward and authenticity in um, or how it's being kind of authentic and genuine in weaving in these these different um, ideas, especially considering the level of things like social systems being brought to to the forefront, which is awesome, awesome to see. Thanks. Thanks, and uh, Julie, I'll have your question, and then after that's addressed, you'll you can come back okay, on and I'll come so. back and wrap us up. Um, so, so much going on, and really looking forward to future discussions. I I was wondering, is there a way in which you see our committee plugging into anything? I mean, all of the things, but do you have kind of specific things that you? you see yourself coming to us in the the near term and and maybe even the longer term but any kind of taking all of that like are there ones that bubble up as kind of the nearer term priorities that you would be asking the committee to help support Julie, the the quick the, the safe answer is no um, but we have not, well, we haven't, we haven't had this conversation. And I, I want to be very careful that, you know, USTCRP has not talked about what it wants to do with the, with the academy next. Um, the scientifically, there are, you know, from a, from a physical sciences standpoint, there are a number of issues that, that, you know, come to mind. Um, you know, we're talking a lot about tipping points. We're talking about a lot of extremes. We're talking a lot about compounding um, risks. Um we are wildly uh, aware of the lack of social sciences in the program and the need for social sciences. You know, the big uncertainties, we're, we're studying all sorts of things except the thing that we know is the most uncertain thing in the, in the whole operation, which is how humans are gonna act. We're, we're very much aware of that and need to deal with it. Um, and and we we have this new piece on climate services. Um, and, and we know that this committee was built to do something different um, and yet you're, being enormous help to us now and how are we going to to cope with that in the future so there are a number of things that from my personal perspective are on our radar um but i i can't tell you exactly what usccrp is going to want next no thank you and it's more kind of food for thought for thinking forward as well because it's great to hear everything going on and like there's so so much going on but <laughs> um Anyway, well, so we are at time for today. So I want to just take a moment and thank everyone so much for a very full, very informative first day. I certainly learned a lot and look forward to circling back and thinking more deeply about these topics tomorrow. So I'd encourage you to continue to ponder these ideas overnight and please join us again um, for day two. Um, just uh, we'll be meeting again as an advisory committee at 9 a.m. Eastern and um, with everybody else at 10 a.m. Um, the advisory committee members, I would encourage you to jump into our shared bike rack meeting notes document and I, I'll post it again in the chat and kind of reflect on what we've heard, like the various items to capture what future discussions um, this, these conversations have spurred for you um, and what are those morsels, as Emily mentioned, um, that, that may lead to further discussions down the road. Um, and with that, I think um, ready to adjourn for the day and I think passing along to Stephen for any further details or things I've forgotten um, and I wish I could be there in person. I'm sorry I can't, um, but I hope you all have a wonderful time in the conversations that follow um, this evening. And I really look forward to, to connecting again in this hybrid setting. Um, thank you so much for making that possible um, tomorrow.
Yeah, and I'll just add that um, building on what Maria said about their uh, experiences within agencies in the SGCR and the breakout sessions that really inspired us to build in really substantial time in this meeting for us to talk with each other. Um, and so tomorrow we'll really be focusing on taking what we were talking about today about these principles and the stages and then folding in AI. Um, we're not going to come away with specific recommendations for specific tools in different stages, but where do we see some opportunities and where do we see that we need to really have those guardrails really high and um, how are we helping frame a conversation that USGCRP is already having and needs to continue to have. Um, so thanks for today and we look forward to joining together again tomorrow. Um, tomorrow we're meeting in public session from, um, from 10 a.m. until 2.30.